You ever had a day where you just want to cry? <laughs> okay. Good morning. This is not how I wanted to start. I'm sorry. I'll tell you who I am and why we're here in just a minute. This is an email list. How many of you got the welcome email yesterday? Good. If you did not get the welcome email yesterday, please make sure that you look at your email address here. Make sure that I have it in here correctly um, because I'm going to be sending you after class emails, wrap up emails. It's going to go over everything that we go over in class. Guys, I'm going to cover a ton of information. I am literally going to talk nonstop for the next four hours. And it's a lot to go over. So I give you an after class wrap up that kind of summarizes everything and gives you links. Well, if I don't have the right email address, you're not going to get it. I'm also going to enroll you into the online course as well for additional practice. And that's why we need the email. So good. If it's okay, please put your name or okay or something in here to let me know that you saw it. So go ahead and uh, pass that around. This is not your book. <laughs> you have a different book now. You have a white spiral book that you see in front of you. And we're going to go over all of the books in a minute. Or actually a few minutes. Okay, testing, one, two, three. Caitlin, if you can hear me, can you please tell me that you can hear me? Um, please let me know in Slack, please. I'm having me, thank you. Okay, major technical issues today. All right. Okay. So we are ready to go. Does this work? No, it does not. Of course it doesn't. Does this work? Ah, yes. All right. <sighs> okay, now we're back in business. You're going to find that a picture really is, I know this is a lot of time that I took, but a picture really is worth a thousand words. And if I have on-screen graphics to help you guys, you're going to get a link to this later because I'm recording it. And remember I said I talked nonstop for four hours. I'm going to go over a lot of information. You're going to have access to this so that you can review it as many times as you need to as we go through the program and after the program when you're getting ready for the state exam. We do live stream this. So right now it's live going out to all of our platforms. And uh, that allows you to be able to access the replays on YouTube or wherever. But more importantly, if you can't come to class for some reason, whatever that reason might be, you can still tune in live. And you'll actually see in the bottom here, you'll see questions pop up. So when somebody asks a question, my assistant, Caitlin, hi, Caitlin, is going to pop it up on the screen. If you see a question pop up, because I can't see this it's behind me, let me know and then we'll answer their question. So it's a way for you to attend without physically being in the classroom, okay? If you're sick, please attend virtually <laughs> so that we don't make everybody else sick, okay? Good? Questions? All right, housekeeping things before we get started. Bathroom through the archway on the right. I don't know why the fire marshal tells me I have to tell you this, but in case of uh, emergency, your exit is there. There it is. If that one doesn't work, there's another one right back there. Just open the door and go out. In an emergency, though, if you open that back door and go out, take a right. If you take a left, it's going to lead you to a fence. It's not going to help you a bit. So out the back to the right. Smoking area is also out back. If you go out back to smoke, unlock the door before you go out. It'll let you out. It just won't let you back in if you don't. Okay, good. You can eat and drink in this room. I have no problem with that. Just clean up after yourselves, please. Um, liquids, if you can dump them in the sink before you throw the cup away, that helps me tremendously. We will have about a 15-minute break somewhere around 10.30, 10.45, or 
probably closer to 1045 because I'm a little bit late. Um, so you will be able to go out and grab something to eat or drink. I know it's a long four hours, guys. I get it. I understand. So if you need to get something to kind of perk you back up, that's fine. Okay. Um, parking is on either side of the building. Cell phone should be off or on vibrate for me. And uh, I only open up the classroom about 10 minutes before class because it takes me a long time to get all of this stuff set up. Um, so if you come super early, go grab a cup of coffee. I won't be here. <laughs> okay. So good. Any questions on housekeeping stuff? We are going to be meeting here Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 to 1 for four weeks. But you guys actually have a very slight... Um, modification on your schedule. The last Wednesday, I will not be here. Now you can still come, you can still practice. Um, the room will still be available to you, but I will not be here. I'm going to give you all of your graduation stuff and information on class seven. I'm actually going to a YouTube conference out in Texas. It'll be the first one that I'm going to, but we're really big on YouTube. We actually passed 100,000 subscribers at the beginning of the year, and we've got over 30 million views. Nice. So we're in the top 8% of YouTube channels in the nation. Huge accomplishment. Um, and uh, because of that, I was invited to a YouTube conference out in Texas, and I'm going. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm super excited about it. So I will not be here for class eight. Just kind of keep that in mind. Um, you're still going to get all the information. You guys aren't getting shortchanged. Class eight was just giving your folders and going over continuing education, which I will do on class seven. Good? Questions? Okay. Whoops. All right, any questions before we get started? Okay, so you have some books in front of you, you've got some papers, we're gonna go through all of that in about an hour. Don't panic, it looks way worse than it actually is, okay? Um, I'm gonna get you through it. Yes, we do have to go through all of this information in four weeks, but I've got a way of doing it that it's somewhat painless, okay? Um, most of what you're going to need to know, I'm going to cover in class. But you will have some homework to do as well. In every class, not complete without homework, right? So let me tell you a little bit about who I am. My name is Patricia Laramie. I am an RN. Everybody out there knows me as Miss Patty. Um, like I said, we are the number one CNA resource on YouTube. Um, our videos are being used by schools, hospitals, training centers, and colleges all over the country, as is our book. So the spiral book that you have in front of you, that is my book. That is my name, and I wrote it. This is the fifth edition. You guys are the first ones to use it. They hot off the press last week. Um, so if you see any errors, let me know. <laughs> i got to fix them. Um, and like I said, our books are being used all over the country as well. So we're way bigger than we seem, right? We're in little old Spring Hill. Who would have thought it? Um, that white book, the spiral book, is yours to keep. Hi. Are you here for class? Yes. Okay, come on in. Come on in. Come on over here and have a seat or there. That's fine. Yep, where there's books. That's fine. So the white spiral book, does she need books? So the white spiral book um, in front of you is yours to keep. You can write in it, you can color it, you can make notes. You can burn it, you can eBay it. <laughs> it's yours. The yellow book, though, please don't write in. You will be returning that one on the last day of class. Okay? So everything that I'm going to talk to you about is always going to come from the spiral book, the white book. That's my book, and I like to teach out of my book. 
The yellow book, as you do your reading, you're going to see a little bit later on in the program, around the third week, that some of the things that the yellow book tells you and some of the things that I tell you aren't going to line up. When there's a discrepancy, you always go by me because my book is written specific for prometric testing, which is who's going to be testing you. So you always want to default to my teaching rather than the yellow book. Yellow book is good for just foundation information. So I do have you read it, but when it comes to the skills, listen to me, not the yellow book. Good? Questions? Okay. Everybody is here for CNA, right? Not plumbing? <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do is show you a video. And this video, I need you to stay awake for. You can nod off later. But this video is super important. This video is going to form the foundation that we're going to build on for the next four hours. So everything that I say in the video, I'm going to say again. <laughs> and little bits and pieces, but I do need you to um, uh, really kind of take this in. Now, all of the, um, and like I said, your pages are not correct, <laughs> what you're going to see on the screen in a minute. Um, all of this content is in your white book, though, so you don't even have to take notes. So in your white book, if you can turn to page, uh, where is it? Let me just get the book. Page 18, page 18 should look like this. Page looks the same, page number does not. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, so Caitlin is going to play the video, the care plan and the CNA, and you're gonna watch it. And then afterwards, we're gonna talk about it. So Caitlin, whenever you are ready. Do I need to do it? The care plan and the CNA. Do we have that one? No, we don't have that one. The care plan and the CNA. Why it's always about the care plan. A presentation brought to you by ForYourCNA.com. Thank you for joining For Your CNA's online CNA test prep. We will be preparing you for both the written and skills portion of the exam. This course contains videos, interactive lessons, activities, testing care plans, test registration instructions, practice questions, and much more. This program goes way beyond our skills videos available on YouTube. But in order to pass the test, there is one single principle that you must understand. The importance of the care plan. Without this key, learning the skills is meaningless. You might be able to mimic what I do in the skills later, but chances are you will fail the test because you didn't follow the care plan. So this course will teach you the skills, but you must first learn how those skills need to be done. and I'll explain to you how the care plan works and why it is so important to the test. We are sure that you will become great CNAs and you will provide excellent care for our residents. But before you get started, let's review some basics. Does anyone know what the initials CNA stand for? Certified Nursing Assistant? That's exactly right, April. A nursing assistant is there to assist the nurse. You will be receiving all of your instructions from the nurse and must follow their directions. 
This will probably include taking vital signs and assisting with personal care tasks. But you may also be asked to assist with other nursing procedures as well. It is important to only do the things that you have been trained to do. If you aren't sure how to do something, ask someone for help. It's okay to not know everything. But please, don't try to do something that you aren't familiar with. It might harm the patient. In this online CNA test prep program, we're going to show you how to do all tested skills. But that is only the beginning of your education. You will learn way more on the job. Because every patient is different and will have a different way that those skills need to be done. And that's where the care plan comes in. As a CNA, you will be expected to assist our patients with many routine tasks. Generally speaking, CNAs help patients with things that they can no longer do for themselves. Things like sleeping, toileting, grooming, bathing, dressing, eating, socializing, and activities. Together, these are called the Activities of Daily Living, or ADLs. These are things that everyone does every day for a healthy life. But not all patients will be able to do these things for themselves because of illness or injury. Sometimes people are too weak to go to the bathroom on their own or feed themselves. And that's where you come in. If a patient needs help with any of these tasks, you will be there to help them. But not all patients will need help with all tasks. This is Henry. Henry had a stroke and has right-sided paralysis. And this is Martha. She had a left hip replacement. This is Bob. He has had a recent leg amputation. And Annie has dementia. And they will all require different care. Some patients will need help brushing their teeth, but others will do that themselves. As a CNA, we will help the patients do the things that they cannot do alone. But we will let them continue to do the things for themselves that they can do. How will I know what I'm supposed to do with each patient? I'm so glad you asked, Cassie. As the registered nurse caring for these patients, that's my job. When a patient gets admitted to our facility, I will do a head-to-toe assessment. I will review all body systems to evaluate the patient for real problems and potential problems. This is a very long, complicated process, but here's a brief overview of a general assessment. I'm going to look at his neurological status. I'm going to look at his cardiac status and his respiratory system. I will also look at his integumentary system, which is hair, skin, and nails, and his gastrointestinal system. His urinary system is important, as is his musculoskeletal system. And then I will review his endocrine, lymphatic, and reproductive systems. And finally, I will review the doctor's orders for this patient. I will use all of this information to determine the patient's real and potential problems. Here's an example to put it into perspective. Let's say that this patient has just had a right hip replacement. Now we know that she will need to continue her activities of daily living. She still has to eat, drink, go to the bathroom, bathe, groom, and dress. And after my assessment, I know that she did all of those things herself until today. However, she cannot get out of bed for any reason for the next three days. So, since we know that she must stay in bed, I have to figure out how to meet all of her ADL needs. The easiest way to evaluate basic needs is using the TEAMS method, toileting, eating, ADLs, mobility, and special. As the RN, I'll take all the information I gathered during the assessment to figure out the best way to help her. She can't get out of bed, so I have to figure out the best way to meet her elimination needs, bedpan or catheter. I also know she is at risk for constipation, since she's not moving much and she's on pain medication. This is a potential problem. She can feed herself, but the trays must be brought to her in bed. She can't sit all the way up because of surgery, but she can't eat lying flat either. She has dentures, so they must be within reach at mealtimes and they must be cleaned daily. She's able to clean herself as long as the supplies are brought to her, but she can't reach her legs or feet, so she'll need help. She is on total bed rest for three days, and she also needs her dressing changed every day. You can see how the RN uses all the information available to create a plan of care specifically for this patient. 
This is called a care plan, and it's something that only an RN can do. Of course, this was a simplified version of the care planning process. A real patient's care plan is much more extensive. Every single aspect of her health, condition, and ability level will be evaluated in order to help her. Even the smallest decision can have long-term consequences. The RN will write a detailed care plan for the entire healthcare team to follow, and the care plan must be followed exactly. So every patient will have a different care plan? That's correct, Ben. Every care plan will be different because every patient will be different. Even patients that seem alike because they have a similar diagnosis or have had the same surgery may have differences in care. CNAs don't have enough education or experience to know all the differences. So as a CNA, your job is to read and follow the care plan for every individual patient. In fact, you could say that your job is to follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but the care plan. Do you think you can do that? Can you follow directions exactly? I can. Absolutely. Sure, yes. Awesome. Then you're well on your way to being a great CNA. But helping patients with ADLs isn't all that you will do. You are also there to help the nurses by making observations. The CNAs are the hands and the feet of the patient. If the patient is cold and cannot reach their sweater, you will get it for them. If the patient can't brush their own teeth, then you will do that for them. If the patient can't get up to shower, then you will help them stay clean. You will become their hands and feet to help patients with things that they can't do themselves. But you are also the eyes and the ears of the healthcare team. You will report everything you see, hear, smell, or feel to the nurse. This is the most important task that you have as a CNA. If you see redness around a wound, you must report it. If you hear the patient wheezing after walking to the toilet, you must report it. If you feel that a patient's skin appears warmer than usual, you must report it. If you notice that a patient is coughing when eating, you must report it. As a CNA, you will be spending much more time with the patient than the nurse does. So you will be in a position to notice a lot more about the patient. The nurse needs this information to make decisions about the patient's care. Reporting these observations gives the nurse another assessment opportunity. That new assessment may even change the tasks you are assigned to perform. This is called the nursing process, and here's how it works. The RN assesses the patient and develops the care plan. This gives you specific tasks to do. While doing those tasks, you notice things. You report those observations to the RN, and the RN performs another assessment to review the changes in the patient. That new assessment prompts changes in the care plan, and this gives the CNA new tasks to do. And the cycle continues around and around as the patient gets better or worse. This is a continuous process until the patient is discharged. I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying the care plan is going to change all the time? Yes, it could, depending on the needs of the patient. Let me give you an example. The care plan told you to make an occupied bed in room 201. As you change the sheets, you notice that the skin on the patient's backside was red and irritated. You notified the nurse, who then reassessed the patient. The nurse decided that the patient needed to be repositioned every two hours around the clock. This was added to the care plan as another task for the CNA. Using this model, we can respond to the needs of the patient quickly as their needs change. But it also works for patients that are getting better, too. You've been assisting Mr. Hopkins with transferring out of bed and into a chair after surgery. But you notice he isn't leaning on you any longer. You notify the nurse. The nurse reassesses the patient and decides that the patient can transfer on his own now. The care plan is changed, and this task is removed from the care plan since the patient is improving. Doesn't this mean that I'm going to be bothering the nurse all the time? Won't they be annoyed? The nurse should never be annoyed with you for reporting changes in the patient. They are legally liable for every aspect of that patient's care. Since the nurse requires that information to plan the patient's care, they expect to receive updates from you on the changes that you see. But how often you will have to report changes to the nurse will depend on the setting you are working in. 
Nursing home patients are pretty stable and don't really change all that often. That's pretty common for long-term care facilities, like nursing homes and ALFs and even home care. But in other settings, like hospitals, rehabilitation centers, and hospice, patients' health can change rapidly. In those settings, nurses and CNAs are going to work closely, and constant communication is required. Since CNAs must follow the care plan and are not allowed to alter it, they can't solve problems. The RN is ultimately legally responsible for the care of that patient. If you have information about the patient that you're not giving to the nurse, the patient can suffer, and the nurse is legally liable for that. Remember, you are an assistant. You are there to help, but the nurse is always in charge of the patient. So all changes, regardless of how minor they seem to you, must be reported to the RN. When the patient is stable, you will not have much to report. It may go days without talking to the RN. But if you notice something, then it must be reported, even if you don't think it matters. If you aren't reporting observations, the nurse can't rely on you anymore. And if the RN can't rely on you, then you aren't a good assistant to that nurse. You must report to the nurse everything you see, hear, smell, or feel. Be a good assistant and report all changes and observations. This is the most important job you have. So the care plan is developed by the RN, gives the team tasks, CNAs follow the care plan, and report changes. Let's recap what we learned today. Can you tell me how a CNA knows what each patient needs? The, the care plan. plan. As a CNA, you follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing but... The, the care, care plan. plan. Anything unusual that you notice about the patient, you must report it to... The, the nurse. nurse. Great job. For the exam, you will receive a care plan. What should you do? Follow it exactly. That's correct. If you don't follow the care plan, you will fail the exam. It's that simple. Now that you understand the care plan, I can show you how the skills will be done for the exam. But remember, you must always read and follow the care plan. That's a big part of the skills exam. Take the brief quiz below to make sure you understand. See you in the next lesson. Okay. So got it? The care plan? The care plan. Our life is all about the care plan. Okay. So let's go to page um, 20 in your book. And let's see if you truly get this. <laughs> Let's take about, uh, I'll give you about 10 minutes. Go ahead and answer those eight questions in 10 minutes. And then we're going to go over it together. There's no, it, this isn't a um, pass fail. Okay. This is just an activity for you to kind of see how this is going to work. So we have a question from Debbie. With Prometric, do we have to wear gloves when dressing a resident with a weak arm? Debbie, I'm going to be talking about gloves in detail on Wednesday. So you're going to want to tune in to Wednesday's class. To understand about gloves. So that question has a much more complex answer than just yes or no. Caitlin, that's me. I'll be right with you.
I'll be right with you guys. I'm trying to get this the slides that I made with the new for the new book. Uh, I'm trying to get it downloaded. I don't know. I am not a big fan of Apple. That's not going to work either. All right. Well, I thought I was going to be able to do it. I can't. All right. You guys ready? Number one, you received the displayed care plan. How far are you going to walk this patient? How come we can't walk them as far as they want? Not with their care plan, so. Okay. Easy answer. It's not on the care plan. You guys get that? Easy answer. Most of the answers that you're going to be giving are easy answers. It's the care plan, the whole care plan, and nothing, nothing but, but the care plan. Got it? Got Makes it. sense? Yeah. All right. So um, for number two, what do we need to help this patient stand? Why? Uh, they can walk, but they need assistance. Okay. What's the easy answer? The care, care plan. plan. Yep, care plan, the whole care plan, and no, nothing no, 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 no. but the care plan. All right, so I'm plugged into a ton of groups, CNA groups on Facebook. Okay, so you guys have been in here for 45 minutes. This is usually about 20 minutes in, so I'm like really late today. You guys have had about 20 minutes of instruction, and you now have that concept down pat, right? You know it's all about the yeah, care yeah. plan. The reason that I start you out with this is if you go on to any of those CNA groups on Facebook, you're going to see questions like this in the group. Real world, CNA is saying, my patient can't stand. What should I use, a walker or a gate belt? Walker. What's the care plan saying? There it is. What does the care plan say? And yet people will jump in and say, well, I use a walker. I use a gate belt. I use a sit to stand, I use a Hoyer, I'm not lifting anybody, right? All of these opinions, do those opinions mean anything? No. no, because those patients are individuals and what may work with this one isn't going to work with that one and that's not your decision to make. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we tend to get ourselves into trouble trying to come up with answers. CNAs don't have answers. CNAs have the care plan. But what if we can't follow the care plan? What, what, what should we do then? What if something happens and we can't follow that care plan? We don't have a gate belt. The care plan says gate belt. I can't find one. What do you think I should do? Yeah, talk to the nurse. Absolutely. So for us, we only have two doors. We either follow the care plan or we go get the nurse. That's it. So how hard can this test be, guys? Right? How hard can the test be if all we can do is follow the care plan or notify the nurse? That's it. That is your entire reason for being. Where we run into problems is when we start to try to think. 
Now, this is going to be really, really important on the written test because the written test is going to try to trick you into thinking. Are we allowed to think? No. 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 So we've, we've got to be really careful here and clearly understand our role. But let me give you an example of why this might be important. Okay. Why should we? Years ago, years and years ago now, there was a CNA that was working in a long-term care setting and the hallway that they were on had a lot of diabetic patients. They put most of their diabetic patients on that one hallway and the CNA, um, you know, what was doing the, the daily tasks, taking care of the patients. Well, there were a couple of patients on that hallway that were brittle. Now, when we talk about brittle diabetics, it means that we can't really control their uh, blood sugars. So, you know, we're pretty good with diet and medication and exercise. We can kind of get you where you need to be, but there's some people that just don't respond to all of that. And their um, blood sugars can go really high and they can go really low and it doesn't really seem to have any correlation with anything. They just are all over the place, right? So this CNA on this hallway, um, they had a patient who would get dizzy and weak and pale and sweaty. And the CNA would go tell the nurse, hey, the patient's looking kind of funky. And the nurse would go mix sugar and orange juice and give it to the patient. The patient always perked right back up. And this went on for months. Patient gets pale, sweaty, dizzy. The CNA tells the nurse. The nurse mixes sugar and, and orange juice, gives it to the patient. The patient gets better. Well, on this particular day, her nurse was at lunch, not on the unit. The covering nurse was dealing with an emergency on a different unit. So CNA looks at the patient, pale, sweaty, dizzy, feeling kind of funky. So the CNA goes and mixes sugar and orange juice like she's watched that nurse do a million times and gives it to the patient. Patient died three days later. And that's because the signs of low blood sugar and high blood, blood sugar can be deceptively similar. What the CNA didn't know was when the patient had symptoms and she went and told the nurse, hey, the patient has symptoms, the nurse looked at a readout because the patient had a continuous blood glucose monitor on. So the nurse would go look at the readout and see where the patient's blood sugar was before treating them. The CNA did not see that step. So the CNA just did the action without the information. This patient did not have low blood sugar today. The patient had high blood sugar and we dumped way more sugar in and tipped them over into diabetic ketoacidosis, which resulted in a coma and death. All because she thought she was doing the right thing. CNAs kill just as many people every year as surgeons. We don't talk about it. I think we should be talking about it. The way that we help is to not hurt. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we've got to be super, we, the, the CNA felt horrible. She thought she was doing the right thing. She thought she was helping. But does that make the family feel any better? No. So we've got to have very clear understanding of our roles here. Does that make sense? Good. So the state test is trying to figure out, do you have a clear understanding of your role? <laughs> That's what they're trying to figure out with the written test questions. Now I've got a resource for you. I've got a free ebook that you're going to get that will help you work through the written test questions, figure out what they're asking, how to answer them. I'm going to give that to you in your email later on in the program. So we'll get the written test covered. If, but if you understand this, you're in good shape, right? We follow the care plan. If we can't follow the care plan, we, yeah. Now, while we're following the care plan, if we notice anything, something smells funky, sounds funky, looks funky, feels funky, we should notify the nurse. They should know everything that we know. 
So let me explain to you how this works. I'm an RN. And this lady comes into our facility. And when she comes in, I'm going to do a head-to-toe assessment. I'm going to figure out everything she's got going wrong with her. I'm looking at her real problems and, just as importantly, her potential problems. My job, if I do it right, is to prevent any of those potential problems from becoming a reality. Okay? I want to realize that this could happen. Let's keep it from happening. Good? So I got my work cut out for me because she's got a lot of things wrong with her. And as I do my assessment, I'm looking at real problems and potential problems. I'm going to come up with a plan for every single one of those, right? And that plan is going to tell you exactly what to do. And I'm going to tell you what I want you to look for, what I want you to report, how often I need her vital signs taken. So if I'm going to do everything with her, okay, if I don't have anybody to help, if I'm responsible for all of her care, that means because she can't get out of bed, I've got to help her with toileting. That's a call light. In the morning, I'm going to have to help her brush her teeth. In the afternoon, I'm going to have to go in and take her vital signs. During meals, I'm going to have to bring in her tray and feed her. Now, if I'm doing all of those things, which are routine tasks, right, that pretty much anybody could do, right, now I my time is tied up and I can't assess the next person that comes in the door. Does that make sense? So I need a helper. I need somebody that I can say, hey, go feed that patient. Hey, go brush her teeth. That frees me up to be able to do the higher level tasks that I do. That's the role of the CNA. Now, a lot of CNAs get this kind of mixed up though, right? You are part of the team. You're a very important part of the team because if you're not helping me, then all of my time is tied up with her, right? So you are a very, very important part of the team. But more importantly, because you're spending more time with her, you're in a position to notice things. You're gonna notice when she's not eating as much. I'm not gonna have any idea. You're gonna notice that she hasn't peed in 12 hours. I'm not going to have any idea, right? So you're a very, very important part of the team. But sometimes we kind of mix up effort with um, role, okay? You guys are running your tail feathers off. Absolutely running your tail feathers off. I might be sitting at the desk writing all those care plans. Now, you might be running your tail feathers off, see me sitting at the desk and think, I'm not working. But if I don't do my job, you have no care plan to tell you how to do yours. So you're starting to see that effort doesn't necessarily align with the actual job. Good? Questions? So it's important for me to bring that up because out there in the clinical world, we have a lot of CNAs versus the nurses. Now, it should never be that way because, you know, there's something trying to kill this lady, right? That's why she's here. And if it's me versus you, nobody's trying to take on what's trying to kill her. So who's the one that's going to suffer here? Sure. Yeah, now, if it's you and me on a team versus whatever's trying to kill her, She's got a way better chance of success. Does that make sense? So if you find yourself in a position where it's you versus the nurse, you probably want to look for a different position because you're not doing your patients any good. Good? Now, I wish with all my heart that I could stand here and tell you that every nurse you're going to work with is great. I can't. I wish I could, but I can't. But I do have the ability to tell you that I am going to make you a great CNA. And hopefully you'll rub off on some of those nurses. That would be a good thing. And that is my mission. I've been doing this now for 17 years. Full time in education for 15. I've got this program down cold. And it works. 
It's going to work to help you pass the test. It's going to work for you to know what to do in a clinical setting. It works. And a lot of you are going to go on in the, into nursing and you're going to take these principles with you when you go into nursing. And that will make you a more effective nurse for your CNAs. We have, last I counted, out of the 15 full-time years, because I really wasn't counting the two before, um, we have over, um, that's just been a while since I counted, about roughly 40% of the people that have sat in these chairs went on to become RNs. Out of those, I have five that have completed their master's degree. And I have one that just completed her doctorate in nursing. That's amazing. And they all started right here. That's amazing. So the, the, world is literally wide open for you but as you go through your levels no matter what you decide to do if you take these principles with you it will make you a much more effective leader good questions all right so let's go down real quick to number five what is a safety concern for this patient for this patient I was supposed to call it out. Are we raising hands? I don't know. Oh, yeah, just call it out. Okay. Yeah, I'm not that kind of a teacher. Right. Right. <laughs> I am not I'm that kind say. of a teacher. Oh, that I didn't tell you that. Yeah, I'm not, guys, I'm not that kind of a, a teacher, okay? So if you need to go to the bathroom, your adults get up and go. Don't ask permission. Your adults have been taking care of that by yourself for a long time. I don't need to be involved, <laughs> okay? Um, if you need to take a phone call, step outside and take a phone call. Not a problem. When I ask a question, shout it out at me, please. There's nothing worse than standing up here and talking to silence, right? That, that's, that's unnerving. It is unnerving. So please be involved. <laughs> it makes my job so much nicer. <laughs> All right, so number five, what is a safety concern? They're in an inappropriate position for oh, yeah, how do we know that? Okay, so the care plan actually tells us, guys, I'm going to tell you that there's no care plan on the planet that's going to tell you that they're in an inappropriate position for eating. So you got to look with your eyes to determine that, right? This care plan does, thankfully, so that's a big clue. So if your care plan is telling you, hey, they're not sitting up straight, what do you think is going to be an important step? If the care plan is telling you they're not sitting up straight, what do you think is an important step? Put them in the right one. Yeah, get them sitting up straight, right? That that would that because that's kind of like a neon sign. Hey, pay attention, right? So sometimes our care plans can give us some clues. So let's go down to number uh, eight. How long do we have to count for? One, one full minute. One full minute. Okay, so how many of you guys have nurses in your family or nurse friends or people that you know in your orbit? Yeah, they'll tell you, oh my gosh, we never count for a full minute. That's insane. We only count for 15 seconds and multiply that by four. But we don't do that. Nobody does that, right? And if you go into the test and you're listening to those people and our care plan says, one full minute, but you got somebody in your ear going, we never do that. Be a real nurse. Count for 15 seconds and multiply by four. They'll be impressed. You didn't follow the care plan. What do you think is going to happen to your score on the state exam if you don't follow the care plan? Yeah, it's not going to be good. <laughs> that is correct. So... You need to understand that the very first place we start with every single skill is the care plan, no matter what it tells us. If it tells us to stand on one foot, we're going to stand on one foot. We're going to follow that care plan exactly. And that's how we pass the test. But it doesn't stop at the test. Because if we have a patient with AFib, and you try to count that pulse for 15 seconds, you are not going to get an accurate pulse. 
If I'm writing a care plan, my AFib patients have a full minute count. It's the only way we're gonna get accurate. And I've gotta give them a medication. And I can't get that medication if their pulse rate is too low. And if you're not counting appropriately, and the pulse rate is too low, and I give them the medication and it takes them out, I could kill them, right? So following the care plan does not stop with the state exam, good? So we know how important these care plan things are, right? Wouldn't you want the ones from the state exam? If I could give you the testing care plans, wouldn't that be awesome? So like you'd know what it would say ahead of time? Wouldn't that be great? Right? Well, there they are. These care plans on this page are testing care plans. There they are. But that's only four. Where is it? Hold on, it's here. There we go. That's only four of them. We're going to learn how to do 21 skills in here. I gave you four. You want the rest of them? I would. Yeah. Go to page 25. These are the actual testing care plan sets that you will get on the state exam. Here they are in real life. When you go take the state exam, you're going to get one of these 11 sheets. One of these 11. Each of these has an ADL skill, a mobility skill, and a documentation skill on the care plan. You're going to have to demonstrate everything on this care plan exactly the way that it's written. So you have these in your book so you can take a look at them. Okay. Good. We'll go into skills timing and all of that in a little a uh, little later in the program. But you have all of the testing care plans. So let's go to page. Hold on. I really, I you know, I spent all weekends make, making these new, the new slides, and now I can't get them to work, and I'm like lost. All right, so let's. Um, Else. Go to page 89 for me, please. So activities of daily living, it's what we do as CNAs. We are going to help patients with things that they would normally do themselves but can't. So how many of you guys have brushed your teeth this month? Mm. Okay. You're perfectly capable of brushing your own teeth. Nobody's helping you with it. You're pretty independent, right? How awkward would it be if I came into your house at six o'clock tomorrow morning, armed with a toothbrush and a tube of toothpaste, and said, open up? How weird would that be? Pretty weird, right? Learning how to specify what you're going to do before you do it to them so they're not. Yeah, them. but you can brush your own teeth. Wouldn't it be a little weird for a grown adult to come in and insist on brushing them for you? Wouldn't that be weird? Yeah, do you think you're probably going to let me do that? Oh, you're going to take that toothbrush, show. I got it. <laughs> Thank you very much, right? So, as CNAs, we're going to help patients with things that they would normally do for themselves but can't but we're only going to do the things that the patients can't do. If our patient can brush her own teeth, by God, they'll brush her own teeth. If they can toilet themselves, thank God. <laughs> I don't want to be involved in that. But if they need the help, that's what I'm there for, right? So we are going to help patients with things they would normally do for themselves but for some reason can't, but we're only going to help them with those tasks that are indicated on the care plan. Now, what's your name? Louie. Louie. 
So now Louie can brush his own teeth, and we've already uh, decided that I'm probably not going to brush his teeth for him because that would be a little weird. And for the next week, he brushes his own teeth, and everything is fine. Life clips along. But then I notice that his toothbrush hasn't moved in like three days. I might ask Louie, hey, what's going on? Your toothbrush hasn't moved in like three days. <laughs> Are you needing some help? I may make an observation. Who would I report that observation to? The nurse. The nurse. That's right. Good? You understand your role there? Questions? So we're going to help patients with things they would normally do for themselves but can't. And if we make an observation, we're going to let the nurse know. But activities of daily living, that's what we do. And this is why we do it. Because patients never stay the same. They either get better or, in some cases, they get worse. But they aren't static. Like me, I'm pretty much the same as I was yesterday, pretty much the same as the day before. And my knees hurt a little bit more today, but you know, that's not that big of a deal. I can still take care of all the things I need to take care of, but not all of our patients are gonna be like that. Usually if somebody needs our help, they got something bigger going on, right? So they might be getting a little worse, or in some cases, hopefully, if we've done our job right, they might be getting a little better. Good? That's why this process exists. So the RN assesses the patient, develops a care plan that tells us what to do. We follow that care plan. While we're doing those tasks, whatever those tasks are, we should be making observations, right? This is half of our job, guys. We do and we observe. This is us right here. We do and we observe. Half of our job is? To observe. Observation. Yeah, take a look. Take a listen. And then whatever we notice, we're going to report to the RN. Now, if our RN is good, they're going to go in and do another assessment, assessment which will change the? Perfect. And that will give us different yes. tasks. And while we're doing those tasks, we'll also? And then we're going to report those. <coughs> starting to see this whole process, right? And it ends when we spit the patient out to go somewhere else or, yeah, the, yeah, or they're no longer here, okay? So the, the whole process is designed to help patients that are getting better or getting worse, but we need to understand our patients are never static unless we're in long-term care. Now, when we're in long-term care, that's, that's the whole, the name says it all, right? Long-term care. These patients need help, daily help, but they're probably not changing a whole lot, okay? So those care plans are going to be very static, right? This is Bob. This is what we help Bob with every day. Bob is the same. Bob wakes up early, early, early. Bob doesn't like breakfast. He just wants a cup of coffee. Bob lays down for a nap around 10. And then he gets up at 11 and goes to the activity room until lunch. After lunch, he stretches out. And at 4 o'clock, he's always in the TV room watching the military channel. Right? And then at 5 o'clock, he goes to dinner. And by 6.30, he's in the hallway just kind of watching what's happening until he goes to bed at 8. And then he gets up at 3 a.m. And we do it all over again, right? So Bob is always the same. Does that mean you should stop watching Bob for changes? No. No, because Bob may have a change at some point. So we can be happy when Bob is Bob and is always the same because now we know what to do. But if we notice that Bob isn't eating anymore or Bob all of a sudden is eating a lot of breakfast, I mean, like he's eating and saying he's hungry. Should we report that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, because that could be like the very first sign of diabetes. 
So if we know that Bob only has coffee in the morning and the last three days he's been asking for a lot, a big breakfast, that's probably something you need to let the nurse know about. Especially if he's super thirsty and peeing a lot too. Those are the three signs we're looking for. Good, makes sense. Understand the nursing process and how it works. All right. Oh, we have a question. Good morning, Miss Patty. Oh, hey, Helen. Thanks for doing what you're doing. I just want to ask if you have a special book that have only care plans I would like to buy in order to understand the various formats. Yeah, um, Helen, good question. I do sell these, uh, this care plan set, this laminated care plan set. I sell it on my website, courses.foryourcna.shop. So yes, you can buy those. It's also my book. You can buy the book and it's on page, what page? 25. 20, 25? Was it 25? I think it was 25. 25. I will learn these new pages eventually. <laughs> All right. Here. Oh, where? Seven. Okay, there we go. All right, so this forms the first principle that we're learning in this program. So if you look along the back wall, you'll see a whole bunch of banners back there. They're nice and bright and colorful and aren't they cute? <laughs> By next week, you are going to know almost everything on that back wall. I'm not giving you stuff to memorize. That's not what this is. If you memorize something, you're going to forget it in two weeks because it's not relevant. It's not about memorizing. It's about learning the principles so they actually become part of you and part of your practice. And we've already got the first one down because we follow the, the whole care plan and nothing but the care plan. And remember, the care plan tells us what we need to do with each patient. So they're all going to be a little bit different. What do we do when we're following that care plan? What's half of our job to observe? Yeah, and who do we report those observations to? Okay, so you guys know this principle. So out of 11, you got one down. Yay. Great job. By the end of today, we will also have the opening and the closing down. So just like I taught this to you, I'm going to teach you those things so that by the time you leave, you're not memorizing a bunch of stuff. You're learning why each step is important. And that actually makes it part of what you're going to do. Good? Okay. And then Wednesday's class, we learn five. So a lot to learn. Uh, one of the big ones that we're going to learn is love rules. And uh, it takes me about an hour to teach you about gloves. It's a really big one. We're not going to cover it today. It's a huge concept. And I've got to break down some of your misconceptions in order to build up what you need to know. Okay? So Wednesday's kind of a tough day. I'm going to challenge what you think you know. So we understand the skill rules, right? Everybody good? Okay, so we're going to move on. Different page. All right, so let's go to scope of practice. And this is going to be, I got to, go to page 14 for me. So the skill rules that we just learned, um, this is on page 22, but you don't have to go there. It's fine. Um, I've got a lesson on it, but it really covers what we just learned, that we as CNAs follow the care plan, we observe and we report, right? That's what we do. So that is our scope of practice. But along the way, you're going to be asked to do other skills. So I'm going to teach you 
21 skills in here. Okay, we're gonna learn hand washing today. I'm gonna teach you some skills. And those are the skills that are gonna be tested on the state exam. And they provide a very good foundation for you to build on, but it's not the end of your education. And that's because where you work may require a different skill set from you. Okay. Um, if you go to work, what's your name? Jessica. Jessica. Jessica, if you go to work in a mother baby unit, <clears throat> right, you're going to learn how to swaddle infants. And you are going to become an awesome swaddler because that's what we do in the mother baby unit, right? Now, your name? Gabriel. Gabriel. So you go to work in a mental health center as a mental health tech. You're not swaddling anybody, <laughs> right? So teaching you swaddling isn't really going to be advantageous. It's something that you would need for that particular job. So when you go to work, you are going to learn additional skills relevant to that particular place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're laying a foundation here, but all of these principles that I'm going to teach you are going to apply to any future skills that you learn. That's what makes them principles. Okay? They never get violated. So let me give you a, a real world example. Let's say, what's your name? Paula. Guys, it takes me about four weeks to learn your names. Do the math. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Paula goes to work at a uh, local rehabilitation center. I'm sorry, a local same-day surgery center. And Paula goes to work in pre-op. Okay, so she's going to help people get ready for surgery. These are same-day surgery, right? You go in, you have your surgery, you recover, you go home. You don't stay. Same-day surgery. So you go pre-op. You're going to help people by giving them a bag to put their clothing in. You're going to make sure that their bladder is empty. You're going to make sure they have no nail polish on. You know, all the things they're going to teach you how to do. And you're going to get people ready for surgery. Um, but you're probably not going to do things like putting catheters and do IVs because that's more nursing. Okay? Doesn't mean you can't be trained to do those things. We'll get into that in a minute, delegation. But for the most part, we're going to keep it kind of simple. Remember, you're freeing up a nurse. These are all tasks that have to be done, but you're freeing up a nurse to do those higher level tasks, right? What's your name? Kayla. Kayla. All right, so um, Paula tells Kayla, hey, I'm working at this great same-day surgery center, and they have an opening in post-op. You should come apply. And Kayla does. She goes, applies, she gets the job, and they hire her. And Paula says, yeah, I didn't have to learn anything new. It's super easy. Well, Kayla's position, a little bit different. She's in post-op. So she's going to have to be trained on how to recognize certain signs of um, anesthesia reactions. She probably is going to be trained to take out catheters. That's a routine task. We can train you to do that. It's okay. So they go out to lunch. And Kayla says, oh, my gosh, I have to learn all of this new stuff. And Paula's like, I didn't have to learn anything. What's going on? We work at the same place. Same check. What's going on? Well, the reason is because not every CNA position is going to have the same skills required. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Even in the same building. So your CNA forms a foundation that you're going to build on. But your next question is probably going to be, well, how do I know what I'm allowed to do? Here we go. How do I know what I'm allowed to do? So can I do that? Am I allowed to take a catheter out? Nobody knows, right? Everybody's like, I don't know. How do I answer this? I don't know. She didn't tell us yet. <laughs> what do I need to know? So the answer is, as an RN, I can train anybody to do any task that I can do with a caveat. There's five rules I have to evaluate to decide whether delegation is appropriate. What's your name? Lindy. Lindy. 
So if I want to train Lindy on how to take out a catheter, there's five things I have to consider. First, foremost, is that a job I'm allowed to do? Like, I can't train her to do cardiothoracic surgery because I'm not trained to do cardiothoracic surgery, right? So the very first thing is, this is something I'm even allowed to do, right? Very first rule. Makes sense. Second question I have to ask myself is, is this a routine task that doesn't require any judgment at all? Is this something that you can be trained to do and just do it, right? Routine. No judgment. Just do it. Like hand washing, right? The third question I have to ask myself is, is she even trained? I mean, Lindy, have you been trained to do this? Do you know how to do this? If not, then we need to make sure that you are trained. The fourth thing I need to do is to make sure that she has all of the supplies and she doesn't have to figure out on her own what she needs to do the job. Okay, so are the supplies available? The fifth thing is, am I available if she runs into a problem? Okay, so as long as all five of those things are met, I can say, hey, Lindy, you're working here. I want to train you how to take out catheters because it's a very routine task. Our patients are getting ready to go home. Um, this doesn't require any judgment on your part. I want to train you to do that. Our facility allows techs to do, that's another part of this, right? The facility has to allow it. Our facility allows techs. So I'm going to train you. Now training doesn't have to be in a classroom. It can be. It doesn't have to be. Training can be one-on-one. -on -one. It can be at the bedside. And that's usually how most training is. Because remember that a lot of the new skills that we're going to learn are specific to that patient. Okay. So training at the bedside is better, but it can be one-on-one -on -one in a lab setting as well. It can be in a classroom, but additional skills are going to be taught to you. And then you're going to have to demonstrate that you've got it. I can't just say, hey, you got it. <laughs> I need to watch you to make sure that you have it. Because here's the important part about this. Okay. I'm the nurse. I am 100% responsible for that patient. Anything that happens to her, good or bad, is on me. 100%. If I ask Lindy to take out her catheter, everything good and bad that happens to that patient is my responsibility 100%, even though her hands are the ones doing the task. So I got to really trust Lindy because it's my license on the line. So when somebody trains you how to do something, you have to do that something exactly the way you were trained to do it. Don't adapt it on your own because the minute you adapt it, you are now liable because I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> Make sense? Good. It's all about liability. So delegating, I'm absolutely able to delegate stuff to you and I will. Throughout your career, you are going to be trained to do different things based on the patient population that you're working with. Perfectly within all of our rights to do that. But you have to make sure that you receive training. You have to make sure it's a routine task on a stable patient. And you have to make sure that you have the right supplies and somebody to call. So if I ask, what's your name? Roque. 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 So if I ask her, okay, hey, can you take out a catheter? You've never been trained. What are you going to tell me? Um, very good. Very good. You're not going to wing it. You're not going to pull up YouTube and <laughs> figure it out, right? You're going to notify the nurse. I have not received that training. I don't know how. I haven't been trained. As long as you do that, you are well within your rights. Now, let's say that Roque was trained on taking out a catheter. Okay, you got that down, no issue. And I say, okay, can you go take the catheter out of this patient? And you go in and the patient is um, bleeding profusely. That's is before or after the catheter pulling? Before. You walk in and they're bleeding. You going to pull that catheter? No. 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 This is not a routine task on a stable patient. That's a... <gasps> <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> right? So when we have those, what do I do now moments, who do we go get? Nurse. Nurse. Yeah, we don't have to figure that out. We don't solve problems. 
So routine tasks, stable patient. Got it? You understand delegation? Yes. Who has liability? Yes. As long as you are doing exactly what they tell you to do and you're following that care plan, you do not have liability for anything. You step outside of that care plan, you are 100% liable for your actions. I'm not taking on the liability if you're doing something I didn't tell you to do. Right? So stay under your liability umbrella. Okay? So throughout this program, you're going to have a ton of questions. You are going to come up with, trust me guys, 17 years of doing this, right? You're sitting over there and you're thinking about, but what if? What if? I love those what if questions. What if? And the answer is I can't answer any of your what if questions because those are patients I've never met. Remember, everybody's an individual, right? Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that your what if question can be answered by one of five answers. Every what if question in the world as a CNA can be answered in one of five answers. And those five answers are right up here. You see this in your skills book on page 13. So it's called the five key phrases. Five key phrases. There it is. There it is. So if your question is, well, can I use a gate belt on that patient? Your answer is going to be right here. We follow the, care plan. the whole care plan and so your answer is what does the care plan say, right? So if you have a what if question, chances are it's probably going to be answered right here. But let's say that the care plan says you can, you know, use a gate belt. So we've got that answer. The next one is CNAs do normal. And I just gave you this, routine tasks on stable patients. So if you have a gate belt, care plan tells you to use a gate belt, you go in and the patient's all slumped over. It doesn't look like they can hold up their arm, much less their body weight. Care plan says gate belt. Patient doesn't look like I can use a gate belt. Right? So we're going to report it. So CNAs do normal. Routine tasks on stable patients. If, it, if, this, if this isn't normal... We aren't doing it. We don't do higher level. Don't do it, right? CNAs do normal. Over here, principles, the, uh, principles guide performance. That's all the, the uh, principles that we're going to learn on the back wall. So you may ask yourself, well, how do I wash a patient? We're going to go over that. How do I know when to wear gloves? We're going to go over that, okay? So the principles that we're going to learn are going to tell you how to do the skills. This tells you what to do. This tells you who to do it on. This tells you how to do the skills. And above everything else, we always remember it's always about the patients. And we're going to report all observations to the RN. Right? So the phrase I want you to remember is help isn't help if it doesn't help. Let me give you an example of this. Several years ago, uh, we built a new house, and I love it. I got to build my dream house. It was awesome. Lived on the property in an RV for two years with all the houses being built. And once we got in and got settled, I work a lot. I work on average 14-hour days, seven days a week. I don't take days off. Like this whole weekend, I was working. So it doesn't give me a whole lot of time to do housework on this brand new house that we had built. Right? And I want to keep it looking nice. So I hired a house cleaner. I actually hired a team to come in and clean my house. Now, my mistake was I assumed that if you hired a cleaning team, they would know what to do. Right? I didn't lay out my expectations clearly. I just kind of went through the basics. I want the floors done, sliding glass doors, you know, um, ceiling fans, wipe off the counters, just, you know, kind of basics, right? Well, I go into my office, shut my door, they clean. Four hours later, they leave. You know, I, I come out, I pay them, they leave. And I start looking around. 
Well, the sliding glass doors, they're, they're tall. They're you know, like eight foot tall. And they were only cleaned up to about six feet. The floors, they did not pick up any of the little throw rugs in the bathroom. Just a little, you know, these aren't like huge rugs, just little throw rugs. They mopped around them. Um, the countertops, they didn't move anything. So when they cleaned, you've got, you know, like dust areas. <laughs> right? So is this their fault or my fault? Their fault. Why? No specifics. Okay, I didn't lay out exactly what I needed from them. I didn't out well, I didn't have them come back. Now I'm cleaning my house and it's not getting done as often as I need it to. <laughs> but um the thing is that help doesn't help if it isn't helping, right? Because I paid them for coming in and cleaning, but then I had to go back and clean, right? But you said clean the counters and they only partially cleaned it. Right, right. And they didn't pick the rugs up to clean the floor. You know? So <clears throat> here's the thing. Our patients are kind of going to be like that, right? They have ways that they're going to want things done. So it does help us if we kind of get a sense of what our patients expect from us. We want to work with our patients as partners in their care, not treat them like they're a byproduct of the care. Does that make sense? So when I say it's all about the patient, that's what I mean. It's always about the patient. That's how we really do help, right? I can teach you how to do the skills. That's the easy part. Teaching you the right spirit to do the skills with, that's a little bit trickier. And that's what we're going to focus a lot of the class on, is those underlying principles. The little things that you may not think about, but that make a big difference. Good? Questions? Questions? So it, through the program, when you have those what if questions, but wait, Miss Patty, what if? I want you to look up there and see if one of those five things answers your question, because I guarantee you I'm going to use one of those five things to answer your question. Okay, good. Good. Because if I give you a specific, if I give you a specific answer to your question, well, let's take the question that we had earlier. Um, Caitlin, can you throw that question about gloves up that Debbie had earlier? There we go. So remember Debbie asked this question a few minutes ago? She says, with her metric, do we have to wear gloves when dressing a resident with a weak arm? That's a specific question, isn't it? It's a specific skill. Dressing a resident with a weak arm. Well, I can give you about 16 answers to that question. And they're all going to start with, it depends. So let's just take it at surface value. Do we wear gloves when dressing a resident with a weak arm? Well, are they leaking anything? We don't know. We don't have enough information there. Do they have a wound, a rash, a sore incision? Are they incontinent? We don't know. We don't have the information. That is going to have a different answer than you that just for some reason has a broken leg and I got to help you get dressed, right? Different patients. Good? Makes sense? So if it's a normal arm. Okay. So yeah, CNAs do normal. Okay. But our principles are going to guide our performance. We have a whole principle on glove use that tells us when to wear gloves, when to put them on, how to take them off, and why we're wearing them in the first place, right? Who they're actually there to protect. So the short answer to that question is, as long as, remember I've always got 16 answers for everything, right? As long as your patient isn't leaking anything, right? No blood and body fluids, and you're not touching any personal skin, so I'm assuming the patient probably has some undergarments on. I'm not going to be anywhere near their personal skin. And um, we're not going to be touching any open skin, like rashes or wounds or anything like that. Then I don't need gloves for that skill. 
So the principal is going to tell me what I need. Does that make sense? So again, I'm going to go to one of those five <laughs> answers right there. I can't give you the one answer that you're looking for. Okay. Good. Questions? Does that kind of make sense? I'd like you to have that tool in your tool belt. It'll make sense a little bit more as we go through the program and you see me apply those. It'll make a little bit more sense to you. But remember that I'm always going to be pointing to that poster. That's why this one is on this wall and the rest of them are behind you. Good. All right. Moving over delegation. Going over liability. All right. So we're going to break here. Go ahead and take 15 minutes. Come back at five till. And we're going to get into the testing process. What to expect on the test.
And we're live again. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pass this out. This is a resources flyer. We have created a lot of things beyond what you see in this classroom. And I try not to overwhelm you on the first day. I'm going to be kind of sending you little things in the emails after each class. Um, but we have a, a ton of stuff. This kind of sums everything up in one sheet. So I'm going to pass these around, um, take one and pass it around. But this kind of shows you what, uh, what we have available. Okay. So any questions before we move on? Any questions? All right. Let's talk about testing day. So when you go take the state exam, we're going to go through the test registrations together in class uh, next week, next Wednesday. And if you register, when I give you the registration paperwork, you should be testing about a week or two after graduation. Perfect timing. Long enough that you can practice, short enough that you won't forget everything. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what happens on testing day. Our closest testing center to us here in Spring Hill is in uh, Tampa. There are other testing centers. There's Ocala, Gainesville. Uh, there's actually two in Tampa. They're, I mean, they're, they're all over the state, but there's not very many of them, and most of them are in larger, yeah, larger cities. So um, I'll be going over all that with you, you know, when we do the registration. But when you go to test, you're not testing with the people in this classroom. You're going to be testing with seven strangers because everybody registers independently. So when you go, you know, seven people you don't know are gonna be there with you. When you go into the testing um, center, you can only take three things with you in the testing center. You take your test admission letter and you can um, print it out if you have access to a printer. If you don't, you don't have to take it. They have it there. But if there's a discrepancy, like I had a couple months ago, I had a student that thought it was the 13th, but it was actually the 14th and she missed her testing day. So um, if she, she didn't have her testing letter to prove, you know, to show, she had to go home and get it and bring it back. And sure enough, she figured out she was in there on the wrong day. Um, so having your test admission letter is good if there's a conflict. Other than that, they can look it up. It's no big deal. You, uh, you can take your keys in, that's fine. And you have to have two forms of ID, one with a photo, government issued, non-expired. That's important. So driver's license, state ID card, passport. The other ID has to have a signature. So your social security card, a debit or credit card, or passport, driver's license, that type of thing. So one with a photo, one with a signature, and they have to match. The names have to match. So, um, so like you've got two last names, Rosario Fernandez. Fernandez. So both of your IDs have to have both of those names. Um, they have to match exactly. Good? Questions? You can't take your cell phone. No electronic devices, no study material. So you're going to be sitting in this waiting room with seven strangers and nothing to do. Don't make friends on testing day. The reason that I say that, and we were a testing center here for many years, and there wasn't enough volume to keep up the testing center, so it moved to Tampa. But we were a testing center here for many years, and I saw it happen more times than I can count. When you're sitting in that waiting room, you're going to be um, talking because there's nothing else to do, right? And it'll come up. Well, my teacher told me that we had to have 10 paper towels 
to dry our hands with hand washing. And you're going to be sitting there going, my teacher didn't tell me that. 10 paper towels. What do you need 10 paper towels for? Somebody else over here is going to say, oh, no, that's not correct. You have to have 12. Anything less than 12, you're going to fail. And somebody else is going to say, no, 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 it's only four. And by now you're like, how many paper towels do I need? <laughs> Give me the answer. The answer is it doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Nobody's counting. <laughs> okay. But you have to remember that you're only as good as the person that taught you. Right. And not everybody that's teaching CNA understands the test. So some people overcomplicate things to make them feel a little more important. They just overcomplicate it. It's not that complex. But can you imagine sitting in that room trying to figure all that out, right, on testing day when your stress level is already way up here, right? That's just going to freak you out. Don't make friends on testing day. But here's the real problem. Remember I said we're the number one CNA resource on YouTube, right? So everybody in there has seen our videos. Our videos are used by, in schools all over the country. When they find out that you actually went to Miss Patty's class, you're going to get like instant celebrity status. It's so funny when it happens. Students come back and tell me that all the time. But you're going to say, well, but Miss Patty said it doesn't matter. You know, and so you're going to be giving information. Okay, they're going to go in and test. Now, if they fail hand washing, the last piece of information they got came from you. So if they fail, who are they blaming? Because you're the last piece of information. You can't teach a class in a waiting room, guys. It's impossible. So don't make friends. After test, spread the word. I want everybody to go out and evangelize the whole world on how to do this stuff properly. Teach to your heart's content. But in the waiting room on testing day is not the time to do that. Does that make sense? It'll save you a ton of heartache. Because you mean well. But they're trying to assimilate what you're saying with what they learned and the two probably aren't going together and things are going to get lost in the middle. Make sense? All right. So when you go in, um, you have your two forms of ID. They check you in and they're going to put you into a waiting room. Now, outside of that waiting room, so this is where everybody's kind of situated here. And there's going to be a room for a computer test and a room for clinical skills. When you go take your clinical skills test, all of these people in here are not watching. You're in a room with a door that closes. So these people have no idea what's happening in here. You're not on a stage in front of hundreds. It's a very private testing experience. If I constructed a wall right through here and put a door in it, that would be your testing room. Okay, it's got two beds, it's got a supply shelf, it's got a bath, it's a patient bathroom area, that would be your testing center. All of you people would be out here. Good? Questions? No? All right. So you are there. You show up with seven other strangers, and the evaluators are going to break you up into groups of two. Now, this is not random. They don't just point at two people and go, you guys, group one. You guys, group two. It's not random like that. This actually takes them about 20 to 30 minutes to put you into groups. It's a very complex scientific process that they have to, um, to do. So when you go in, you get checked in, you're gonna be sitting in that waiting room for about 20 minutes looking at each other going, why haven't we started yet? Let's go, <laughs> right? So just understand that the evaluators are doing an evaluator task to put you guys together. And I'll explain why this is so complex in just a second. So for the sake of simplicity here, just for demonstration, I am going to break you up into groups randomly. So you guys are group one, stick around. You guys are group two, 
you're going to have about 30 to 45 minutes to kill. So you can stay in the waiting room, but remember, you don't have your phone, you don't have study material, it's kind of boring. You can also go out to your car and study there. Just be back in here in about 30, 45 minutes, okay? You guys are group three. So you've got about an hour and a half to kill, so go grab a cup of coffee. You guys are group four. You got about two and a half hours before you're going to be testing. So chili, super one margaritas. We'll see you in a little while. So I would bring group one into the testing center and show you around. You've never been there. You don't know where the washcloths are. You don't know what a privacy curtain is in this place. You don't know what they're using for a patient bathroom area. So I'm going to take you in and show you around where everything is located, like a little mini orientation. Make sense? And then after I've showed you around, oops, after I've showed you around, we're going to give you your testing care plan set. Now these, remember these we talked about this morning? You guys remember these, right? You have them in your book. The computer randomly picks a skill set for you. The evaluator does not. The computer does. It's actually coded into your Prometric ID number. So when you come in, give me a number one to 11. 10. 10. So um, the computer randomly picks skill set 10 for you. This is your skill set. Now, I can't even trust that you know how to read, so I'm going to read the skill set to you. And then after I read it to you, I'm actually going to give it to you, and that is yours throughout the entire test. What do we know about the care plan? You it. We're going to follow it. We don't expect you to memorize it. So during the test, if you get stuck, Go over and read the care plan. Remember, we're being graded on following the care plan. So that is yours throughout the entire test. Go back and read it. But you need somebody to do those three skills on. So your skills are measure and record pulse, perform passive range of motion to the elbow and wrist, and provide a partial bed bath to a resident in bed. Those are your three skills. And you need a patient to do those skills on. Hmm. You're sitting there with nothing to do. So you are going to be the patient for him to put, do all three skills on except partial bed bath. That's a little too personal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a mannequin step in for that skill. We have four skills that we're going to use a mannequin for. Partial bed bath is one of them. Good. So when you're the patient, you're actually going to get a script. When you're a patient, you have to be pleasant, cooperative, and follow the script. We also want you to be you, not a 90-year-old version of you, just you. Good? So if somebody gets ambulate with a gate belt and you're the patient, I don't want you to do this. <laughs> okay you're gonna walk like you walk okay you're gonna turn around and walk back good make sense okay how many of you have family friends at home that you're gonna be practicing on when you go home tonight you're gonna tell them first day good my teacher told me that I have to tell you when you're my patient be cooperative. That is their job. Be cooperative. Yep. Because the problem is that they're going to try to throw you worst case scenario. They all do. I don't know why they do this. They all do this. Don't let them do this. Establish the ground rules today. You be pleasant, cooperative, and you. My teacher said. What if they're grumpy? Well, if they're normally grumpy, then good luck. <laughs> good luck. So everybody got it? So you will be testing on another testing student, and you will be the patient for them while they're testing. Good? Any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, so let's say, like, you gave him the skill set. 
would the other person get a different spell? Okay, good question. Now, usually, okay, so let me back up. Remember how I said that it's a very scientific process and breaking you up into groups? Okay. When you get checked in, they're going to ask you, do you have any medical conditions or anything that would prevent you from being a patient for any of these skills? And most of you are going to say, no, I'm good. I'm fine. Right. But if you just had oral surgery done and you still have stitches in your mouth, we want to know that before we make you a patient for mouth care. Because we don't want you springing a leak <laughs> during the test. Right? So we'd want you to say, no, I just had some oral surgery. I had some teeth removed. I've got some stitches. Well, now you can't be a patient for mouth care and denture care. So you're out. You can't be a patient for mouth care and denture care. You come in and I ask, do you have anything? And you say, yeah, I've got some athlete's foot on one of my feet. Okay, so you can't be a patient for foot care. You come in and you say, I just want to let you know I'm allergic to milk and apples. So we can't use you for feeding. You come in. And you say, yeah, basketball injury, ankle's no good. So we can't use you for ambulating, transferring from bed to a wheelchair, right? You come in, you just slid down the road on your motorcycle. You got a whole big road rash thing on one of your hips. I'm not using you for sideline position. You starting to see this, yeah. right? So the evaluators have to look at each one of you guys individually. And then there's some skills they actually have to look at your body size for. If you are going to be walking somebody, they're going to try to pair you up with somebody your body size or smaller. If you're transferring from bed to wheelchair, again, they're going to try to find somebody your body size or smaller. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, remember I said it takes about 20 minutes. There's a lot of factors in here. Well, one of the other factors is what you asked. They don't want to put you and you together if you have the same skill set. So if they can avoid it, they will. Remember, we have 11. But we don't pick the skill sets. The yeah, the computer does. So the computer may send five of you the same skill set today. We don't know. Okay, so sometimes it's out of our control. Good? Does that make sense? Okay, so remember, oh, Debbie, Miss Patty, you spoke about proper dress code. I didn't attend an actual school for CNA, so should I be dressed in scrubs on test day? Oh, that's a good question. For testing, there is no dress code other than closed-toed shoes. So if you, wanna, if you want to test in jeans and a T-shirt, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, the only dress code requirement is closed-toed shoes. Uh, if you want to be head-to-toe in scrubs, surgical cap off, looking like you're going to the OR, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I probably wouldn't go that overboard, <laughs> right? But you want to present, this is a professional certification. My own personal opinion is you probably should present yourself as professionally as possible. There is something to look the part, act the part, right? So that's why in my class, I have my students. I know you guys can't see them because the camera's trained on me, but I have my students in scrubs, right? So in here, you guys wear scrubs. And because I'm trying to get you comfortable with them. Most of you guys, if this is the first time you wore scrubs, you probably felt a little imposter syndrome when you put them on. Like, oh yeah, they're comfortable, but do I really, like, am I allowed to wear, is this okay? You, because it's different, right? It's not your normal attire. So there's something to look the part, act the part. You don't want to just throw on a set of scrubs on testing day if you're uncomfortable in them. Good. You want, you want to try to be comfortable on testing day? But I would certainly put forth as professional an image as you can. Okay, good. All right. So you're going to get one of these 11 testing sets. It's what's in your book. We went over that. It's what... Um, Remind your, your name again? Gabriel. Gabriel, sorry. I told you, four weeks, guys. Um, so the testing um, set that Gabriel has there is one of these 11. This is always up here. You guys are welcome to flip through it. Like I said, you have it in your book as well. 
All right. So any questions on this? No questions? Oh, we already went through that. All right. So I told you this earlier, but here's a visual example of it. I told you that each of these skill sets has one ADL skill, one mobility skill, and one documentation skill. Everybody gets a documentation skill on the test. Well, this um, slide here actually kind of demonstrates that in a visual way. We have a documentation skill, we have an ADL skill, or a mobility skill, and we have an ADL skill. This breaks down each of the skills and what category they fall in. So you'll get one skill from this category, one skill from this category, one skill from this category. There is a lesson in your book. I have a whole video on this on my website. But this is kind of a nice to know, but you don't need to know. Okay. But those are the um, categories on the state exam. So if you look at the back of this, these are the actual testing checklists. Oops that the evaluators are grading you on. So when you get these skills, whatever skill is on the front, the checklist is on the back. So when you go take the test, they're reading these checklists and they're giving you a check mark for every step that you get right. Okay? You don't do a step, no check mark. Just like that. You don't do a step, no check mark. That's what's going to count against you. It's called a deficiency. So no, if you don't do it, you don't get a check mark. Now, the next question that you're about to ask is, how many can we miss and still pass? Nope. What was your question? My question is, uh, let's say I go into the room, I forget to wash my hands, but I correct myself before I leave. We're going to talk about corrections in a minute. Okay. So the, the question that always comes up is, well, how many of these things can I miss and still pass? And the answer is it's not that easy because it depends on what you're missing, right? So let's talk about mouth care for a second. Let's say we're going to go over here and brush this lady's teeth. Sorry, guys, i got a really dry mouth and I'm talking a lot, so i got to get something to drink. So let's say we're going to go over here and brush this lady's teeth. Is she in a safe position? Uh, Why? She gets shown her back. Yeah. So what would you want to do to get her in a safe position? Sitting yeah. However, you, you can get her sitting on the side of the bed, put the head of the bed up. I mean, you got a million options here. Doesn't matter. Just get her up, right? She's got to be sitting for mouth care. So if we kill our patient on the test, do you think we're going to pass? No. No, that's kind of an important step, you think? Okay. You guys all said you brushed your teeth this month? Mm -hmm. So you're somewhat familiar with the skill? Right? Chances are when you brush your teeth, you're standing over a sink. Right? So this morning, I brushed my teeth and I was standing over the sink because as I brush, I look like a rabid dog, man, foam everywhere, and it's going to fall. And I'd rather fall on the sink than onto me. Right? But if we set that lady up in bed, she's not leaning forward like we do over the sink. She's just sitting. So where's all that foam going to go? Yeah, so what could we put on her to help protect her clothing? Okay. Yeah, a towel, washcloth, paper towel, something. Grab something, right? Protect her clothes. Has anyone ever died from toothpaste on their clothes, though? No. So which step do you think is more important? Putting the head of the bed up or putting a towel over their chest? Yeah, the Starting to see? Not every step is graded the same. They're weighted based on the effect of the pa on the patient. Everything is about the patient. <clears throat> Just remember that? It's all about the patient. Everything is about the patient. So every step that you see on a checklist has a different weight to it. So the answer to the question is how many of these steps can I miss is it depends. What did you miss? Because if you don't put the head of the bed up, but you got the towel right, yay. She didn't have toothpaste on her, but she's going to the morgue. You know, not really helpful. So one step would fail you. 
These are what we call critical concept steps. Something that would put our patient in immediate jeopardy. And a lot of skills have critical concepts. And I'm going to go over them with you as we go through the skills. So you'll know exactly what steps are really, really, really important. And we're going to talk about why they're really, really, really important. So that when you're out there, you remember that this step is really, really, really important and you do it. So what you guys don't understand is that you're here to become a, you're here to pass a test to get out there and work as a CNA, right? So I'm training you to pass the test to get out there and work as a CNA. That's not what I'm training. I am training because I will be the body in the bed one day. I am training my CNA. You guys understand the difference there? Huge. Huge difference. I'm getting older, guys. I am going to be the body in the bed. And I've seen what's out there. I am training my CNAs. And I'm hoping that by learning it this way, you'll treat everybody else out there like that too. Okay, good. So these guys, anything without a check mark is called a deficiency. When you go take the state exam, you are going to be graded on skills and a written test. At the end of the test, when you're all done, usually skills is first and then written, usually. But they can play with that. They can do written first. Um, depends on who shows up for the test. But usually at the end of the test, you will, um, at the, I'm sorry, at the end of the written test, you will get your printout. Now, the written test is 60 questions. It's all multiple choice. you got 90 minutes to do it. And unless you have a language barrier or a reading comprehension problem, you should not have any problem with the written test when I'm done with you. Okay? These questions you will actually laugh out loud at. Because I'm training you in a way that makes it easy to do. Okay? Now, if English is not your first language, this does complicate things a little bit, right? Because your brain has to translate all that and figure out all those little nuances. You all may have to practice a little bit more. But for the most part, my students do very, very well on the written test. That's not the one we have to worry about. This is the one that most people stress, though. Most people stress the written test because all you've ever had in school are written tests. It's the one you're most familiar with. So you'll stress this because you know what a written test is. You don't stress the skills because you have no concept. Right? I'm going to tell you, you need to be stressing the skills. That's where you need to be practicing. The written is going to take care of itself. I will make sure that you are ready for the written. Skills is going to uh, take some work on your part. So I have an ebook that you're going to get a link to. This is what it looks like. I don't have a physical one. I don't. Guys, printing these books costs me a fortune. So I don't print this one. This one is a, an ebook, but it's workbook format. You can actually like work with it. It's going to ask you questions, but it leads you through exactly how to answer those written test questions. Um, I'll give you the, the link for it later. Once you're done with the test, though, you're going to get these printouts. So this is the printout for the written test. You can see here, candidate passed the written test. Yay. This does not make you a CNA. You have to pass both sections to be a CNA. Down here, it tells you the different sections on the written test, how many questions were in each section, and how many you got correct. Again, I can't tell you how many you can miss because they are weighted. There are a few questions on the state exam, again, that are critical concept questions. And if you get it wrong, it's bad. But if you select the really bad wrong answer, it can fail you. If you select an answer that puts your patient in immediate jeopardy, we do not want you as a CNA. Make sense? Okay. Um, like I said, by the time I'm done with you, this will take care of itself. It's the skills 
that we want to pay attention to. So this is a feedback on the skills. Um, these are your deficiencies. So, so this is your, these are your deficiencies. So remember that, that slide I showed you had the checklist and anything that check mark was a deficiency. It's going to tell you what they are. Now, in most cases, you're going to see it listed twice. So the same um, checkpoint is listed twice. This same checkpoint is listed twice. And let me explain why. So in Florida, Florida is very unique. First of all, we allow challengers, which is really unique. But the second reason that Florida is unique is that we have two evaluators in the room during testing most of the time. Some days the second one doesn't show up, but for the most part, we have two evaluators in the testing room. Now, if you don't do something, you have a deficiency, but only one RN marks it as a deficiency, it doesn't count against you. That means that RN wasn't paying attention. The other one marked you off. So if it's only listed once, it does not count against you. If it's listed twice, you probably ought to take a look because someday I'm going to be in the body in the bed and that step is going to be important to me. Okay. Don't just get your result paper and go, I passed, yay, and throw it away. <laughs> right? This is always an opportunity for advancement. I don't believe that anybody is perfect at anything as long as we're on this planet. I believe there's always an opportunity to grow. This is yours. Okay, good. Tech is my opportunity to grow. <laughs> I need to learn more about tech. All right, so let's get into the testing checklist. So these are the testing checklists for all of the skills that we're going to learn. It's gonna cycle through all of them. You'll see them all here. You don't have to memorize them, it's okay. Um, but what I did, when I first started teaching, I did not teach very well. I was not a good teacher. A lot of my students didn't pass the test at first because I didn't understand the test. Sure, I was a nurse and I can teach, but if I didn't understand what they were being tested on, it didn't make me an effective teacher. So I started studying this and I made this my mission. I now know everything about prometric testing, everything. I am the subject matter expert that everybody calls when they have a question about Prometric because I made it my life's mission to understand this. Now, the problem is that these checklists are written for people like me. They're written for RNs. They are not written for students. If you're looking at these checklists and you see did the candidate, you, right, because it's asking an RN, did you, that candidate, did that candidate, um, let's see here, use standard precautions and infection control measures when providing care? That's not a question you can answer because you will have no idea whether you violated an infection control principle. That is not written for you. So what I had to do was take these checklists, filter them through the RN brain and write them out in a way that students can understand and duplicate. And that's what I did with this book. Okay. So what I did is take these checklists and write them in a way that you can understand that'll teach you how to do the skills. And then I'm going to demonstrate them so you can see how it should be done. So it's show and tell. Who knew that fifth grade was going to come in so handy in my adult life? Okay. But what's interesting as I was doing this about 15 years ago, what I found was interesting was as I was going through these checklists, I started to realize, hey, number one is the same on all of them. And hey, number two is two. So number one is 
Great resident, address by name and introduce self. I can work with that. So if all the skills have to start that way, well, let's create something called an opening that teaches students how to start the skill that gets that checked off every time. And that's how the principles were born. So everything that you're learning on that back wall, I created when I started going through these checklists. And now it's the standard. This is how everybody teaches. Number two is also the same. So number two is provide explanations to resident about care before beginning and during care. So basically talk to your people, tell them what you're doing. So we got to work that in, right? So this is how we're going to learn how to do the skills. Now, when I got to the end of the skills, I noticed there's a lot of similarities there too. So step one and two, always the same. Toward the end, Ask resident about comfort needs on every single checkpoint. Now, some of them, though, this is what I found interesting. Some of them are just one line. Ask resident about comfort or needs during care or before care completed, right? But some of them have a sub point. So I thought, okay, well, wait a minute. So everybody has to ask about comfort, but there's some that we have to check the water temperature. So which ones are those? And how can I make it so that students understand that easily? And that's how washing rules was born. So these principles that we're going to learn are directly related to testing checkpoints. See the correlation? Good. All right, so we're going to learn the opening. We really don't have time for the activity today. Let me just go through it really quick. I usually hand this out and give you an activity, but we're just going to do this um, a little bit easier. Deanna asks, Miss Patty, do the students online get the materials sent to our emails? Uh, Deanna, no, unfortunately, I don't. I used to have a way for students to sign up for it, but I'll tell you what, if you send me until I get that, my website's under construction. If you send me an email at foryourcna at gmail.com, number four, Y-O-U-R-C-N-A at gmail.com, tell me that you want the after class wrap up emails, we'll add you to the um, our, our list to send them out to you, okay? All right, so we talked about the principles and how I developed them. So what I did was I made them puzzle pieces so that they can kind of mix and match, right? So every skill follows the care plan. We know that. We learned it's all about the care plan, the whole care plan in. And while we're doing the care plan, we're going to observe. And who do we report all the observations to? Okay. So when you see this, those four things are always in play. We follow the care plan, we observe, we report. Okay. Every skill starts the same way with these steps. These steps are always the same on every single care plan, every single uh, checkoff sheet. So we have a puzzle piece to represent them. We're going to learn about gloves on Wednesday. We have a puzzle piece to represent that. And then we got some things that are skill specific, right? That only apply to that skill, no others. So we have a puzzle piece for those steps. And then we have the closing, which is how we end every skill. We're going to learn the closing today as well. So if you put them all together, that is a skill. So all of these steps, everything you see here, this is the checklist, all of these steps will be checked off with five things to remember. That's it. Instead of learning all of this, isn't it easier to just learn five and just use them over and over and over again? That's why our program is successful because it's simple. I like simple. Simple is easy to replicate, especially when you go to the test and everything in your brain evaporates because you're tested. That's what's going to happen on testing day. You're going to walk in. You're not even going to remember your name. Uh, uh, uh. Right? So I need a process that gets you through 
is the anxiety. And that's what we're going to work on. These are all right here for every skill. Every skill. So these are always up here, too, for you to play with. And I'll show you how to use them a little bit later in the program. It's kind of a fun game. Um, I'll show you how to use them to kind of review and prepare. But these are always available for you. Now, you have a different version in your book, which we're going to get to here very shortly. And they correspond to the testing uh, checklists. So let me go here. We already know that. Yes, we've done skill rules. Okay, so these four are always found in every skill. doesn't matter what we're doing. Every skill starts with skill rules, right? Got to know what to do. We start every skill the same way with the opening, which we're going to learn in a minute. We have to evaluate gloves for every skill, and we're going to do the closing at the end. These four, automatic, out of the gate, you know you got to do those. How many others we have to add in is going to depend on the skill. Okay? But out of the gate, four apply to every single skill we do. I used to, uh, unfortunately, you guys, because we're running late, I used to hand these out, and everybody was responsible for a specific uh, principle. Like, you're the opening, you're going to be really busy because, man, you are involved in every single skill, right? Your skill rules, you're going to be involved in every single skill. And when I make you responsible for that, and then you can help others learn it, um, it becomes a little bit more real to you, but unfortunately, we're, we don't have the time to do that. So, we've already been through that. So, let's talk about the patient. This, before we get into skills, this is on page 21. Point out a couple things that you may not think about when it comes to patients. Where do you go when you're sick? <laughs> yeah, my mom. Um, home is a good one, doctor, yeah. If you're really, really sick, where do you go? Okay, all right. So, I told you I work a lot, right? I got him overworked. I actually have a girls weekend coming up this weekend on Thursday. I'm going away for three days. It's first girls weekend in 15 years. I am psyched because I need a break. Right. So I called up my two besties that have been my besties since we were like 10. And I said, we got to get together. So we rented a place and I'm going to go over and we're going to spend the weekend together. It's going to be great. It's where I'm going to go to recharge and rewind and, but if I called up the hospital instead and said, okay, I'd like to reserve a room for th Thursday through Sunday. I just need a little rest and recharge. Do you think they're going to let me in? No. In fact, the hospitals do their best to kick you out, right? You can't just go get a room at a hospital, you have to prove that you're sick enough to be there. You have to go to the ER, and the ER's job is to not let you in. Their job is to try to discharge you. They don't want you taking up one of their beds. Anybody experience that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that means that every person that's taking up a bed in the hospital had to prove they were sick enough to be in that bed. These are the sickest people in our community, the very sickest. Got it? They all brought germs in with them. Every one of them. So the worst germs in the community are all in one house. 
we call it the hospital. This is like pathogen soup, guys. Now, it gets worse. That lady over there is recovering from a hip fracture. She had surgery. Her immune system currently really busy. I mean, super busy. It's trying to heal up that bone, that muscle, the skin, ward off infection. It's busy. Now, what do you think is going to happen if me, as a healthcare worker, doesn't pay attention to what I'm doing, puts on a pair of gloves, touches a whole bunch of stuff, and then touches her? and introduces new pathogens into a patient whose immune system is otherwise occupied. Who is going to fight the new germs? It's going to be a problem, isn't it? Any of you guys ride roller coasters? Anybody ride roller coasters? Okay, next roller coaster you get on, it pulls up 25 seats there. And the guy letting you on the roller coaster says, okay, just let you know, one person on this roller coaster is going to fall out. Have fun. Bye. One out of 25. Could be you. Could not be. I mean, you've only got a one in 25 chance. Would you get on that roller coaster? No. How bad? Yeah. How bad do you need to ride it? Right? <laughs> right? Well, here's a sobering statistic one out of every 25 people in a hospital will get an infection they did not come in with now they're not wandering room to room how do you think they get those infections that's right the staff us us and we have to understand that those people are sick enough that their immune system may not be able to overcome that new infection. We can kill them. Good news is you survived your hip fracture. Yay. <laughs> Bad news is we gave you something else that killed you. Sorry. So infection control plays a big part in this. Got it? We're going to go over infection control in detail throughout the entire program because it's that important. But we have to think about things beyond infection control. That's the glaring one, right? But what about things beyond infection control? Let's think about the patient experience for a second, okay? This lady over here. She is here in a strange place. She doesn't know you guys at all. Has no idea who you are. As far as she's concerned, you're a bunch of weirdos walking around in pajamas. Right? She doesn't know you. So she is in a strange place, surrounded by strangers, and most likely all alone. Because we have visiting hours. We don't let people stay bedside 24-7. You think she feels a little vulnerable? Now, take off all of her clothes. Give her a thin hospital gown. And lay her down. Do you think she feels vulnerable now? We have to consider that this is a job to us. We are upright, fully clothed, and have a mission. Our patient is not having the same experience that we are. Not by a long shot. And we get so wrapped up in our day-to-day -day routines. I have things to do that we forget that this is a terrifying place for a patient. Now, on top of that, gets worse. Your patient is probably a little self-absorbed at the moment. They got something going wrong with them. They got something that's bad enough to make them sick enough to not be home. They're here. Their brain is cycling on how is this going to affect me? Am I going to be able to go home? Am I going to be able to work? Who's taking care of my cat? What is my significant other doing? They're preoccupied. You think they're going to hear everything you say and understand it? Probably not. Anybody ever been a patient in a hospital? Yeah. How many people come in and out of that room? Oh, oh my gosh. The average is, the average, 
17 people every 24 hours, 17 different people coming in and out of that room every 24 hours. You've got doctors, yeah, you've got nurses, you've got techs, CNAs, yeah, but you've also got billing clerks, EKG, radiology, phlebotomy, chaplains, volunteers delivering the newspapers, dietary, it goes on and on. How much rest do you think that person is getting? Okay. Anybody ever been sick? What does it do to your mood? Oh, yeah, grumpy. Yeah, I when I get sick, I want to lay on the couch, watch Hallmark, and bring me what I want and leave me alone. Just go away. Don't talk to me. I'm sick. I want to be left alone, right? We got 17 people coming in and out of your room, and all you want to be is? Yeah, so you're probably going to be quite grumpy. Now, all of those people coming in and out of your room is going to affect your ability to sleep. First of all, you don't feel safe, so sleeping is hard enough, but now you're constantly interrupted. What does sleep deprivation do to your mood? Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't expect your patients to be happy and friendly, guys. That's right. They're sick. They're going to be grumpy. They're sleep deprived. They're going to be grouchy. They're self-absorbed. They're probably not listening to you, right? And yet we seem to think that they have an attitude problem. Wait a minute. Who has the attitude problem here? <laughs> Do not expect your patients to be nice. If you have a nice patient, that's a good day. Yay. But don't expect it. I actually had a CNA tell me one time, well, she started it, meaning the patient. <clears throat> and I'm going to end it. We're going to have a conversation because you do not have clear expectations. Good? Make sense? We have to understand where our patient is coming from so that we can communicate effectively with them. If all we see is our own experience, we are only seeing half the picture. Okay, good. I used to do a, um, I used to do, I, I used to teach a different class, a health science concepts class, and I used to take the TV and I blacked out part of it and then I showed a movie where all you could see was what's on this side of the screen. And it was usually a movie that, you know, I, I made sure that nobody had ever seen it. And I wouldn't play the sound. And I would ask them what happened in the movie. And they couldn't tell me because they're only getting half of the picture. Well, if all you're seeing is life through your perspective, you're only getting half of the picture. And if you're not listening, you're even more disadvantaged. Got it? So we have to stop and think about things from our patient's point of view. Right? Remember, I'm going to be the body in the bed one day, mm -hmm. and I will be grumpy and grouchy, and you're still going to be nice. Mm -hmm. Good? Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, when you're the body in the bed, people are going to give you the grace that you need as well, because sick patients have a right to act sick. Mm -hmm. right? Good? So speaking of patients, oh, Towsy says, I passed both exams yesterday. Thank you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to healthcare. Caitlin, can you write that down for us? We'll send them a congratulations on our live on Thursday. All right. So, um, by the way, it's on the what I just handed out. And I'm going to remind you on Wednesday. I go live every Thursday at 3, and I do a lesson. This week, it'll be from St. Augustine. <laughs> um, but I do a lesson every Thursday, so you guys are all welcome to uh, tune into that as well. It's, um, it gives you additional um, information. So speaking of patients, we have to understand that every patient is different. And sometimes, as we get into healthcare, we tend to forget this. We try to treat all diabetics the same, all hip fractures the same, all... Uh, gallbladder surgery is the same. We, we try to force patients into this mold. And that actually can be detrimental because if you're trying to treat everybody the same, things can get missed. 
we have to understand every patient is an individual and they're going to need individualized care. We're not an assembly line. It doesn't work that way. So let's talk about corrections. Somebody, I think it was you that asked about corrections earlier? Okay. So during the test, you are allowed to make corrections. So we have this checklist that we have to get everything checked off, or at least all the good stuff, right? The big stuff. We're going to get checked off. But what if we do a skill and we realize we didn't wash our hands? Okay. So we can make corrections. Now, some corrections can be verbal, but very few. Most of them, when we make a correction, we are actually going to have to do whatever it was we didn't do. So let's say that I do a whole skill. Let's pick on range of motion that we saw just a few minutes ago. I do my opening, not, 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 hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to do range of motion. Is that okay? Pull curtain. Do the scale. And then I'm going to do my closing. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you? Would you like a magazine before I go? Here's your call light. Environment's clean. Open the curtain and go wash my hands. And while I'm at the sink washing my hands, I realize, uh-oh, I did not wash my hands. Now, that's bad on two parts, okay? The first is that, let me go back. I gotta find it, hold on. There's a lot of slides in here, guys. <laughs> okay, here. So here, remember I said that there's a lot that, that are the same, right? So right here, this line right here says, refrain from touching resonant before hands are clean. It's a checkpoint. It's a critical checkpoint. So if I get to the end of the skill and I did not wash my hands at the beginning, I can say, correction, I would have washed my hands and I'm washing them now, you can check me off, right? Because I'm showing how, but I can't get checked off for this even with a correction because the, the, there's no way to correct this. Refrain from touching resonant until hands are clean. That's a simple yes or no. Does that make sense? So some things we can correct, absolutely. Cool. That means you don't have to be perfect. You can recognize your mistakes. Most things are gonna need to see. Some you can correct verbally. Like, you know, if you didn't pull the privacy curtain at the end of the skill, you could say, I would have pulled the privacy curtain. But hand washing, it doesn't fit that category. Good? Make sense? All right, so moving on. So the next question is, well, when can I make a correction? Do I have to wait till the end of the skill? And the answer is no. You can make a correction as soon as you realize you made an error. And that's usually the best time to make the correction. Like if you start, you know, if you walk over to, you close a curtain, you come over to the patient, you go, oh, oh, I got to wash my hands. <laughs> go, you know, correction. And then you wash them. Now you're, you're getting that credit that you need. So you want to make the corrections as quickly as you realize you've made the mistake. Okay. Guys, in a clinical setting, you're going to be pulled 50 different ways. Call lights are going to be going off. Nurses are going to be asking you to do something. Patients are going to be talking nonstop. Families are going to be asking a million questions, right? You're being pulled in a million different directions. Chances are things are going to get missed now and then. The test is not about being perfect. The test is about understanding your ability to self-analyze and correct when necessary. Good? Okay. It's not about being perfect. You're not going to be perfect out there. I can guarantee it. Nobody is perfect out there. But do we have enough introspection that we can think about the steps that we're making and correct what needs to be corrected? Do you guys ever hear about the surgeon? This is why, okay? This one story illustrates this concept, right? 
So a surgeon doing surgery and leaves a gauze in the patient when they sewed him up. Okay. Now, th there's a process for this. We actually count in surgery. We count in and we count out to make sure that everything that we brought in went out. We don't leave anything in the patient, right? So there were multiple points of failure here, but the surgeon would not admit he was in a hurry. He just left and he had started to, to, you know, sew the patient up. He left, left his PA in charge of finishing it up, did not follow protocol. And instead of being introspective and, and figuring out, okay, there's a problem here. There was a breakdown in process. How can we prevent this from happening again and fix what's here? He just doubled down. So what does that do to the patient, right? Now the patient has to have more surgery and antibiotics because nothing was addressed in a timely manner. We're not going to be perfect, guys, but we have to be self-aware enough that we can admit our mistakes and fix them. Okay? Good? Not going to be perfect. All right, so let's explain how this class is going to work. We're going to talk about the syllabus, which is here. This is your syllabus. You'll see four columns. Remember, this is not the right book. The book that you have is the right book. The first column tells you what we're going to do in class this class period. The second column tells you uh, the, the lessons that I'm talking about. The third column is homework. We're going to go over that in a minute. And fourth column is additional activities. So today we did the care plan activity, right? On page 20, we looked at those care plans and did that activity. So that's already done. We've already talked about corrections are our friends. We'll talk about indirect care in a minute. And we've talked about skills grading. Today in class, we're going to talk about, we've learned skill rules, right? We follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and... And what do we do while we're following the care plan? Observe. Observe. Who do we report that to? The nurse. the nurse. We're going to learn the opening in a minute. We're going to go all the way back to kindergarten and learn how to wash our hands. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn the closing. We'll also learn indirect care. I still have a lot to go over with you. We're starting to get into the meat of it now that we've got a lot of the background out of the way. Okay. The second column, we've gone through most of that as well. We learned about the CNA exam, what to expect, right? We talked about delegation and liability. We've talked about the patient, right? Patient considerations. Um, we've learned about the testing care plans, those, these yellow things. And we learned how we're going to learn the principles, right? So we've already gone over all that. But there are pages in your spiral book that correspond to all of those lessons and I put the pages here for you so you can go back and review them if you wish. Now the third column is the dreaded homework column. Nobody likes that. I wish I could tell you that it's fun and exciting and it's not. <laughs> it's something you got to get through. You're going to go home and read the first chapter of the yellow book. In fact, you're going to take that yellow book home and you're not bringing it back and forth to class. Take it home, leave it home. We only use it for homework. That's it. Okay? Take it home, leave it home. We work out of the white book. Bring your white book to class. White spiral. Um, but you're going to go home and read chapter one in that yellow book. Don't make notes. Don't highlight. You're going to give that book back to me at the end of the program. Once you've taken or done that reading, I need you to take a test to make sure that you got what you needed from the reading. And this is going to be not on page 132. It's on page 181 of your spiral book. So if you open up your spiral book, so you're going to do the reading in the yellow book. And then you're going to open up your spiral book, page 181. And you're going to do those 20 questions. It's pretty easy, 10 multiple choice, 10 matching for vocabulary. But just taking the test isn't enough. 
it's not enough. You need to grade that test to figure out, did you get it right? Because if you got something wrong, I want you to take that opportunity to look it up and learn, right? So if I'm the body in the bed, I'm not going to look up and say, we're okay, is that right? We're okay. okay. I'm not going to look up and say, we're okay, what'd you get on chapter four? Who cares? Nobody cares. Grades don't mean a thing. I'm hoping he learned enough about chapter four that if I'm having a stroke, he'll pick up on it and report it to the nurse. That's what I'm hoping, right? It's comprehension, not grades. So do the reading, take the test, and then the very last page in the book, page 201, is your answer key. So grade the test. When you come back into class on Monday, I'm going to go right down my, my uh, list here. I'm going to go right down my list here, read your name out, and I'm going to say, Jessica, how did you do? Gianna, Cheryl, Ashley, Jacqueline, Gabriel. I'm going to go right down my list, and you're going to tell me how many you missed. Now, I'm hoping, in a perfect world, everybody's telling me 100, because that tells me that you went back and reviewed the information that you missed, and you got it. But if you tell me I got a 70, that tells me that you're struggling with something, and then we're going to have a discussion so I can help explain it. Guys, I've got a million ways to explain everything. The book doesn't always get it done well the first time around. So you may tell me you got a 70 on Chapter 3, and I know I need to go through a couple of those concepts a little bit more. Good? Questions? So homework, reach the yellow book, Chapter 1. In the spiral book, take the test on page 181 and grade it using the last page in your spiral book. Looks like that. Okay. And then if you go back and watch the replay, Caitlin just put it on the screen for you. You'll also get it in the wrap up email. So let's talk about how to use this book. These pages, because like I said, I just redid this book. So the pages are not going to reflect what we're going to be going over together. But if you turn in your book to, let's see here. I have no idea what these pages are. 52. So if we are going to learn Pulse, which we are on Wednesday, we're going to learn Pulse on Wednesday. So we'll be back to this page on Wednesday. But if we're going to learn Pulse, the first thing that we're going to see is page 52. And 52 tells us the specific steps for that skill in that banner. And then next to it, it tells you all of the different principles that are involved. Remember, there's four that are involved in every single skill we do. We have skill rules, opening, glove rules, and closing. Those are the big four. They're always there. And then we're going to add pulse into this. So nothing new to learn for this one. But page 52 gives you an overview. Page 53 gives you the details. So 52 is an overview. 53 are the details. So that's what you see here. Simple, similar, okay? So page 53 tells you exactly how to do this skill. So I pretended that you don't know anything, nothing, when I wrote this. And I wrote it according to the checklist. So I'm making sure that if you do these steps exactly the way they're presented here, you will get a perfect score on that state exam. Now, you can take this book home. This is yours. Find a live human laying around. They'll help you more than dead ones will. Hand them this book and say, read these steps out loud. They read the step, you do the step. They read the step, you do the step. Have you ever been told to go home and practice something and you have no idea how to practice? You don't know if you're doing it right. I mean, practice doesn't, it, that doesn't help. You're fumbling. That's not practice. Practice should be directed. 
And that's what this book does. It directs your practice exactly the way it should be. That helps you build confidence. Now, after you've done it a time or two, you don't need your live human to read it to you. Now you need it, need them to have it and just watch you. And that way they can correct you if you're doing something wrong. So you can actually practice for the state exam way before you get there. Imagine how successful you're going to be. Good? Make sense? Now at the top of the page is that care plan. What do we know about the care plan? We follow it. So whatever that care plan says is what we're going to do. And then at the bottom of the page, you're going to see our uh, supplies for that particular skill. You'll also, on this particular page, you're going to see a documentation form. That's what the documentation form would look like for the state exam. It's their form. And on the bottom of page 52, you're going to see test specific information. Like how long somebody with your level of experience generally takes to do this skill. Who your patient is going to be. Is it a live person or a mannequin? Where are they going to be located? In a bed or a chair? And is documentation required? Okay. So test specific information is on the general page. Supplies are on the specifics page. Good. And you'll kind of get into the rhythm of this as we start learning skills. This is just an overview. But for every single skill we're going to learn, I have those two pages, the general overview and the skill specific. Good? Guys, there's no way you can fail this test. <laughs> We've got it all covered. But we don't stop there because there's background information that you need to know about these skills. So we also, if you flip back, to page 50, you'll see a lesson there on abnormal values. I redid all of this. This just makes my heart sick because I can't show you the good slides that I made. Okay, so you can see on page 50 and 51, a lesson related to vital signs. So this goes over abnormal values. And then if you go to page, let's see here, if you go to page 63, you'll see a lesson on energy conservation that has to do with the skills in that section. So this book is made up of three very specific types of lessons. There's a theory lesson that's reading. I usually talk about it in class. There's an overview that gives us the basics, the principles, and, and a Cliff Notes version. And then there's a specifics that tells us exactly how to do the skills. Okay? And we do that for every single skill. Now, all of this coordinates with um, our online program. You guys are going to be enrolled in the online program today. Uh, you'll get an email about this. And the um, online program is located on courses.foryourcna.com. And in the very front of your book, inside the cover, you'll see that website, courses.foryourcna.com. This, I told you we did show and tell, right? So I'm showing, the book is telling. Well, this course makes it interactive. And I'm going to show you how that works in just a minute. So show and tell, and then you do. So it's kind of hard to understand how can I do something in a virtual environment, but I figured out a way to make it work, and it's pretty cool. All right, so let me get into the opening now. So every skill, how do we know what skill to do? The care plan. So every everything starts with the care plan, right? But once we know what to do, we have to learn how to do it. So the first how is the opening. So every skill is going to start the same way with the opening. But every opening starts with an off. Okay? 
Every skill starts with an opening and every opening starts with a knock. Now, why is that important? Remember your patient over there. We talked about her earlier, right? She is not fully clothed, wearing a thin hospital gown. She is in a strange place, all alone, surrounded by strangers. She is sleep deprived. She is sick and grumpy. And if you just go barging into her space, she is going to feel very vulnerable. We don't want our patients to feel vulnerable. That's not going to set up a good relationship between us. We need her to feel secure in the space that she has, as secure as she can feel. That's why we have to knock. Knocking is non-negotiable. Knocking has to be done before you enter the room every time. If I walk in the room, talk to the patient, walk out and realize I forgot something and go back in, do you know what I'm doing before I, I cross that threshold? No. I am knocking. So I want you to think about this for just a second. That lady over there, she is going to be poked and prodded. In fact, every person that walks in that room, except for the CNA is gonna hurt her. Doctors, uncomfortable exams. Nurses, IVs. Phlebotomists can't find a vein to save their life. They're going to poke her 1,500 times. EKG people are going to put sticky tabs on her and rip them off and take every hair she never knew she had. X-ray techs are going to put her on a hard surface in an impossible position and tell her hold still. Billing, oh, they hurt the worst. Mm. Every person that goes into that room hurts that patient except CNAs. Now, can you imagine our lady over there? She is exhausted. She closes her eyes and she finally drifts off to sleep. And there's a ton of noise in the hallway. She hasn't slept in three days. She's at her wit's end. She finally drifts off to sleep and she hears a noise. And her eyes pop open and there's a stranger standing over her with a sharp object. What do you think her reaction is going to be? Absolutely. She's going to scream or she's going to strike. Me, I'm striking. 100% every time. That's a combo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every time. Yeah. I love that. Well, my patient is combative. Okay. Did you try communication? Was that on the table at all? No, there are some patients that are going to be combative even with communication. But my question wasn't that. It was, did you try communication? Because in healthcare, we skip right over it. You know what? We don't want to skip over it. That knock is your patient's only defense. It is their only ability to control a situation that is totally out of their control. That's how important it is. It is a critical concept. It's going to count big on the state exam. <coughs> Good? You guys understand why? You understand why knocking is important? So I have a question. So when they send you to the room, Mm -hmm. with the two people should you knock before you enter that room or should you just enter the room and wait for the instructions to be given okay so that uh, you're talking about the test hold on mm. your test has not started yet okay you don't have a patient in the bed she's still beside you okay. you don't have a patient in the bed so now when you go into the room when they take you into the room to show you around you're not going to knock okay. and you're not actually going to go outside of the room right into the waiting area or you know, you're not going to go outside of the room. You're just going to stand in front of the door and knock on it. <laughs> um, it's basically we're simulating that we understand how important that is. Okay. Um, but that's only once your test starts. Okay. Good question. That's a good question. I haven't had that one before. Only once your test actually starts. Good question. Now, for the test, we treat it like an open door policy. If the door is open, I'm knocking as a courtesy as I come in. I'm not going to have to wait for them to say come in or anything like that. 
I'm knocking as a courtesy, just an early warning system kind of, okay? But if that door is closed, do not barge in. Guys, there are some things in life you cannot unsee. <laughs> you don't want that in your memory banks. So you knock and you wait. Think about all the things you guys do. Don't. <laughs> Think about all the things you do behind closed doors. Keep them to yourselves. <laughs> We're not sharing, okay? But think about it. So if the door is closed, I'm going to knock and wait. If I don't hear anything, I'm going to knock again louder, more forcefully. If I still don't hear anything, I'm going to crack that door and announce myself. Hey, it's Patty, your nurse. Everything okay? If I still don't hear anything, I'm coming in because there's, there's something going on in there. Okay? But I always give them three opportunities to stop my entry because I know, trust me, I know there are some things that you do not want to walk in on okay good all right so for the test we're going to treat it like the open door policy we're just going to knock and enter now once we've entered we're going to address our patient by name we're also going to greet the patient right it's all about the patient we want to be nice so you want to say something like good morning hello hi Right, be nice um, and address our patient by name. Now, if you're the checklist that we had, and I should put it up here, but the checklist that we had, um, that was number one. Address the patient by name. So for the test, we're not going to have ID bands. Nothing to check. No ID bands. Where do you guys, do you guys live in a home? Like your home? Anybody live in a home? In your home, do you have ID bands? Why? How do those people know who you are? These are relatives, people you've known. Okay, so they know you, right? It's your home. That'd be kind of weird if you walk in your house and have to put an ID band on so these people know who I am, right? That'd be weird, right? So in places where people live, assisted living facilities, nursing homes they are not going to have id bands because that's where they live just like it would be weird for you to have an id band where you live that's where they live no id bands right so the only place we're going to have id bands really are places where people don't live and that's such a small part of our healthcare system, most of our patients are seen where they live. Now, the exception to that is doctor's offices, but you don't get an ID band there either. When you go to a doctor's office, they stick you in a room, no name tag, no ID band, no nothing. Some stranger walks in, looks at a chart. Oh, what's your name? Louis. Louis. This is Louie, everybody. Say hi to Louie. Hi, hi, Louie. Okay. So, I'm some stranger walking in with a chart. So, Raphael, how are you today? What are you going to tell me? My name's not Raphael. Because you don't want what I've got in store for Raphael, do you? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you are able to self-identify. If I call you the wrong name, you're going to set me straight in a hurry. Because this is healthcare, we do unpleasant things, right? We're not giving away a million dollar tax free checks. You can call me any name you want to call me if you've got one of those checks in your pocket. I'll answer to anything. But in healthcare, you better be calling me by my name so I know you got the right person and you're not going to put a thing up a thing and you know do all that kind of stuff, right? <coughs> got it? So. We rely on patients to self-identify whenever possible. Now, if our patient can't self-identify, that would have come up during the assessment, and the nurse would have come up with a strategy and put it on the care plan, and CNAs follow the... So you don't have to invent that, that process either. But for the test, if you remember, if we go back two hours, I know it's a long time ago, I told you that your patient is going to be pleasant, cooperative, and themselves. Got it? 
So for the test, you're just going to address them by name. And we're gonna make this even easier. Everybody for the test is Mr. or Mrs. Jones. One name, all you gotta remember, Mr. or Mrs. Jones. Okay. Good, questions? So we greet our resident, we address them by name. And once we got that out of the way, we got to tell them who we are. Just because I'm wearing pajamas doesn't mean that I hold a position of power, right? So I got to tell them who I am, but it's not just who I am. If I walk in and I say, hey, I'm Patty. Okay. Patty who? Patty the person with the cookies? I like that, Patty. Uh -huh. Patty the person with the needle? Not so much. <laughs> right? So just telling them your name isn't enough. You need to tell them your name and title. So, hi, I'm Patty, your CNA today. So, so far, our opening should sound like this. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is... Or, <laughs> Hi, Miss Jones. How are you today? Remember, you want to greet your patient. I always like to try to find out a little bit about my patient before I get into the skill. Because if I've got a patient who is nauseous or dizzy or weak or just not feeling well, I don't need to go beyond the opening, right? I'm not going to get into the skill. I'm going to stop and report that to the nurse. So I always like to ask, how are you feeling? How are you doing today? Get a little information from them. Okay. So, hi, Miss Jones. How are you today? My name is Patty, and I'll be your CNA today. Good? Questions? Okay, once you got all the formalities out of the way, you got to tell them what you're there for. I am here to insert name of skill here. And for the test, you can actually, if you're really nervous and your brain cells aren't firing, and they probably won't be, remember, you've got this. You can actually pick it up and you can go, hi, Miss Jones. Um, how are you? Um, I am, um, oh, I'm Patty, and I'm your CNA today. And um, I'm here to um, measure and record pulse. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> okay? Perfectly acceptable on the state exam. Try to be a little more human when on the body in the bed, please. But perfectly acceptable on the state exam. But the more you practice this, the more it will roll off your tongue. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. Good morning. How are you today? My name is Patty. I'll be your CNA today, and I'm here to take your pulse. And the more you do it, the more it rolls. And then we're going to ask the most important question in healthcare: Is that okay? We have to get permission. Patients have the right to say no. In fact, a patient can say no at any time for any reason. If you are halfway through a skill and a patient says no, you should be hands off immediately. No means... No. It works here too, guys. So what about memory care? Okay, memory care is a little bit different because your patient doesn't really have the um, understanding, the self-awareness to consent or not. That's actually that consent has to be removed from you legally. Did you guys know that? Yes. Yes. Consent must be legally removed from you. That means that it had to go before a judge. That is a legal precedent because it's an inalienable right okay so in memory care your nurse by them the very nature of them being in memory care right they have lost their ability to consent that means it would have come up during the assessment and we would have something reflected on the care plan good good now when I'm working with memory care patients especially, I generally don't ask, is that okay? Because as our memories and as our brain degrades over time, we get left with a feeling of loss of control, okay? 
if you can't remember things and the place doesn't look familiar, you feel like you've lost control over your life. Well, if you've lost control, a lot of times you will try to establish control by saying no. It's a way of pulling control back. Now, they may not necessarily be saying no to this skill. It's just like a two-year-old who's trying to establish control. Two-year-olds say no to everything because they're trying to establish control over their being, right? At the end of life, we go the other way. We're losing control, so we go back to that no. So with memory care, instead of saying, is that okay? Because I'm probably going to get a no. I would say, I need to give you a shower before lunch or after. I give them very limited choices. That way they still have control. Because right? what they're reacting to is the lack of control. So they still have control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm in the middle of doing a skill on a memory care patient and they start saying no, that's my trigger that something went wrong. I need to stop and figure out what they're reacting to. Remember, it's always a loss of control. So they're reacting to a loss. They're either feeling invaded or the water's too hot or this is taking too long. So there, there's a stimulus there that I've got to get to the bottom of. Good? Makes sense? But yes, I'm still going to go hands off. Because if you don't listen to them, do you know what they're going to do? Absolutely. They're going to get combative. Why? I said no. It's not because they said no. It's because they're out of control. Because, yeah, they are experiencing a lack of control. And that is the biggest threat to your humanity and to your person. So when you have a combative patient, usually it's because they're reacting to a threat, a perceived threat that they have no control over. And that is frightening. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, working with Alzheimer's patients specifically a little bit later on in the program. I've got a whole lesson I'm gonna give you on that that'll really kind of make it click a little bit more for you, what they're experiencing and why. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the program. So everybody good so far? Okay, so our opening. Hi, Ms. Jones, how are you? My name is Patty, I'm your CNA today, and I'm here to whatever, insert name of skill here, is that okay? Now, once you get all of that out of the way and they say yes, and for the tests are going to say yes because they are being pleasant, cooperative, and themselves. So we're not going to have to worry about any of that for the test. Okay. Once we get all of that out of the way and we got the green light, we're good to go. Then we're going to establish privacy. I don't have my, because today was a day. Just turn this real quick. I'm going to do this manually. So once we do that, hi, Ms. Jones, how are you today? My name is Patty, I'm your CNA today, and I need to whatever, is that okay? Awesome. I'm gonna close the curtain. Now I need to establish privacy. Privacy is important, okay? Nobody needs to see what we're doing in here. So I'm gonna pull that curtain, but who touches this curtain? Everybody. Everybody. So nurses touch a curtain, CNAs touch a curtain, pharmacy touches the curtain, visitors pick their nose in the elevator and touch the curtain, patients scratch what itches and touch the curtain, housekeeping. Yeah, is this thing clean? No. No, in fact, housekeeping generally takes this curtain down and physically washes it once a year on average. A year? Yep. Now, in between patients, we do spray it. Now, there's no shade on housekeeping here. They're doing a good job. But, you know, we spray it with disinfectant. But at the end of the day, we can't consider this thing clean. Right? So if you've touched this curtain and you now have every body fluid known to man and then some that you probably don't know about on this curtain, what do you think you need to do? Wash it. Wash it. Those two things should be tied in your brain forevermore. If you touch that curtain, what's the next thing you're going to do? Wash your, Wash your hands. Every time. Every time. Wash your hands. Good? Touch a curtain. Wash, Wash your hands. hands. Wash your hands. Normally, like I said, today has been one of those days, guys. I'm so, so sorry. 
I have a camera over the sink, but I didn't have a chance to activate the camera, so I can't use it today. So I'm going to show you the video for this. The video has very good close-ups. Normally, I don't show the video. I just demonstrate it, but today is a Monday. I need a vacation this weekend, guys. You have no idea. However, I'm going to be working on next week's slides this weekend on vacation. So. Yeah, when I change the book, I have to change everything. And um, like I said, it just it just went to print um, last week. So I'm like way behind the eagle. We'll get through it, though. It's all good. All right. So let me um, let me pull up. Does anybody see my mouse? It's near the nerves of this. OK. Ah, there it is. Thank you. Yeah, it's so small, I can't see it. All right. <laughs> Jennifer says, yes, it's the pressure and anxiety that I'm worried about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I apologize. The sound has to come up right now. Eventually, working, I'll have. When you approach the sink, you can touch the faucet with your unclean hands because the faucet is considered the dirtiest object in the bathroom. Adjust the water temperature for comfort and wet your hands. Apply soap and rub all surfaces of your hands vigorously, focusing on the front and back of your hands and in between all fingers. Circle the top of your wrists as well. Friction is the key to removing all pathogens from the surface of your skin. Friction should be applied for at least 20 seconds to be effective. After washing with friction, the nails must be cleaned. Run one thumb down the length of each nail, starting at the cuticle, and moving toward the end of the nail. Repeat with all fingers of both hands. Then clean under your nails by scrubbing the underside of your nails along your palm to remove debris. Carefully rinse your hands under the stream of water with your fingertips pointing downwards taking care not to touch the inside of the sink or the faucet. Tap your fingers together to ensure that all water droplets remain in the sink. Take paper towels from the paper towel dispenser and dry all surfaces of your hands, the front, back, between your fingers, and your wrists, taking care not to allow the paper towels to touch the unwashed areas of your lower arms. Throw these paper towels directly into the trash bin. Finally, Take a clean, dry paper towel to turn the faucet off because wet paper towels may rip and recontaminate your hands. questions on the opening best place to practice this guys is in your bathroom at home you have a door to knock on you have a person to talk to the one in the mirror you've got a curtain you can pull the shower curtain and you've got a sink to wash your hands so the best place to practice this is in your bathroom at home and you do need to practice it because what ends up happening we're going to put all this together starting on wednesday i'm going to start showing you actual skills and if you don't have the opening down, you're going to be stumbling over the opening and that's not going to leave any room in your brain for the skill itself. Okay. So I know it sounds weird. Send everybody in the house out for ice cream so they don't hear you. That's fine. But yeah, 
It sounds weird, but if you practice this, and that way when we start getting into skills, all you have to do is learn the skill part. It makes the learning go so much easier. Okay. So opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Full curtain, wash hands. Once you have clean hands, you can go get your supplies. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Washing hands, you're going to turn the faucet on. Dirty hands can touch dirty faucet, no problem. That's not an issue. You're going to wet your hands. That is an important step because soap is not going to distribute if your hands are not wet. And no joke, you are graded on bubble production. Not even kidding. You are graded on bubble production. So if you don't wet your hands first and you put soap, you're not going to get that, that good lather that you need that you're being graded on. Okay. So wet your hands, get some soap and get a lot of soap because bubbles count and you're going to start rubbing. Once you start rubbing, you're going to look at the clock right <coughs> above the sink. Now, some of you have been trained to sing songs while you wash your hands to gauge time. Guys, you're going to be nervous for the test. You're going to be nervous. What do you think is going to happen to your singing speed when you're nervous? Okay, yeah, forget the lyrics. It's going to speed up. Yeah, it's not an effective gauge of time. So when you're washing your hands, remember I said there's two evaluators, right? So one of them's over there watching you wash your hands, like eyes on. The other one has a pen and the checklist. And when you wet your hands and put soap and bring them together, okay, when you bring your hands together, they look at that clock right above the sink and they write down where the second hand is. And then you rub all surfaces. When you move to your nails, they write down where that second hand is. And if between the two is not at least 20 seconds, you have failed hand washing. There is no wiggle room here. It is yes or no. Did you rub for 20 seconds or longer? Yes or no? What do you think 19 seconds is? No. no. And no means you failed. So don't use singing as a way of gauging time for the test. Okay? Use the clock. It's there. They're using the clock. You might as well use the same device that they're using. Okay? Good? So you're going to rub all surfaces, everything. So the tops of the wrists, the backs of the hands, in between the fingers, in between the thumb and index finger, bottom of the hand by the pinky. This gets missed a lot. Okay, and palm of the hand. So all surfaces at least how long? 20 seconds. 20 seconds. And then you can move on to your nails. You're going to go down each one of your nails to clean your cuticles. Circle the nails on the palm of your hand to clean underneath. And then you'll rinse. When you rinse, don't touch the faucet or the sink. They're not clean rinse and then you saw me do something in the video i didn't shake i tapped because when you shake water goes everywhere okay pathogens all the bad guys right viruses bacteria yeast fungi pathogens things that are trying to kill you basically need three things to thrive in an environment most pathogens there are some extremes, but most need warm, dark, moist. Well, bathrooms are usually two to three degrees warmer than other environments because we don't like to be chilled when we get out of the shower. Right? So bathrooms are usually two or three degrees warmer. Mom trains you to turn the light off when you're not in the bathroom. You guys are doing a good job of that. That light is off. So we have warm and we have dark. When you do this, you get moisture all over that bathroom and bacteria live in the bathroom. We take them there every day to drop them off. You know, bacteria live in the bathroom. So what you're doing is creating pockets of pools that bacteria can thrive in. And you're going to walk through that and take it all over your facility and even worse home with you on your shoes at the end of the shift. Now, please remember, these are pathogens that were bad enough to make somebody sick enough to not be in their home where they want to be. Do you really want those pathogens in your home? 
So when you do this, you're keeping your moisture localized to a confined area. Good. Then you're going to get paper towels. Nobody cares how many. Nobody cares. Let me say that louder for the people in the back. Nobody cares. Whatever you need to dry your hands, but only dry what's clean. So don't go up here. I didn't wash up here. If I take the paper towels up here and then come back down here, what did I do? Very contaminated. Yep. Good? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And then you want to turn that faucet off with a clean, dry paper towel. Don't use your, your hand-dry paper, you know, the ones that you dried your hands with, because wet paper towels rip very easily. You can rip those paper towels, recontaminate without even realizing it. We don't want to take that over to the patient, do we? No. Their immune system's already busy. Right, good. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the closing. So every skill starts with the opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. Good? So just like every skill starts in a very defined way, every skill is going to end in a very defined way. I think I have this on here. Hold on. Oh, let's do this together. I do have this one. Yay. All right. So I told you that the course was interactive, right? You guys remember me saying that? Mm -hmm. This is an activity in the opening, the lesson on the opening. What we just went through, I've got a whole video in there. Um, so the opening, this is an activity. So we're going to try this together. And we're going to look at this graphic. So if you look at that graphic, what is the very first step, do you think, for the opening? Oh, look closer. What is it? Read the care plan. That's right. That's right, because we have to know what to do. It's a tricky. Every skill starts with the care plan, right? All right, so what's the next one we're going to do? What's our next step? Knock. Okay. If you look through there, what else? What's the next one? I heard... That's all. We're almost there, but identify our patient. Yep. Hi, Miss Jones. And then say my name. Say my name. Yep. <laughs> okay. Then what do we want to do? Explain task. And then close privacy curtain. Okay. What comes first? Washing hands or gathering supplies? Washing hands because you have to have clean hands to get. Clean supplies. So good job. All right. So let's see if we got it right. We're going to hit check. And yes, we got a gold star. Go us. Okay. So these are the types of activities that you'll see in that online program that's going to help you put everything in that order, right? So you're actually doing. So the closing is like the opening, done in a very specific way. Now, there's actually eight seats of closing. You have this in your book. That's why I don't like these slides anymore. Uh, this is in your book on page 34. And there's eight C's to the closing. The first six, the order doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. However you want to do it is fine. But it kind of boils down to you want to make sure your patient is in a clean environment, right? Because people don't rest well in chaos. If there's a lot of clutter, if there's trash, people aren't going to be able to rest very well. Chaos increases anxiety. So if you want your patient to rest well, you need a nice, calm, clean, orderly environment. So take a look around. Is the environment clean? I always use this guide. I always leave my patient looking better than I found them. Always. So that means I might straighten the sheets up. This, this bed right here, this is a mess. Okay. I would straighten the sheets. I would make sure that everything was cleaned up and nice and neat. I also want to make sure my patient is safe. That means are they in the middle of the bed? Is the bed in the low position? So clean and safe. Good. 
All right, then I'm going to ask about comfort. They actually need to hear that word. Are you comfortable? Now, comfort is more than just physical comfort, though. How many guys have a cell phone? What do you do when you're bored? Pull it out. Oh, pull it out, right? Anybody ever just stare into space anymore? Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So out of the class 14, I got two. I had someone who would just count the dots on the ceiling. Yeah. It's kind of boring without stimulation though, right? Yeah, we are social creatures. We require entertainment. If you've ever known a nine-year-old kid, their favorite phrase is, I'm bored. <laughs> well, your patients in a clinical setting are probably going to be pretty bored. And if they don't have, especially our older patients, they don't know how to use a cell phone for entertainment. In fact, most of them don't even know how to use a cell phone to call. Okay, so we can't rely on cell phones for entertainment, especially in the older population, but we have to address the fact that they're probably going to need some emotional stimulation as well. So for the test, we're going to offer a magazine that goes under comfort. Comfort is not just physical. It's also emotional. Does that make sense? So we're going to offer a magazine. So we want to say, are you comfortable? Remember, they have to hear the word. And would you like a magazine before I go? Good. Questions? So part of comfort, too, is the head of the bed. We're going to get into this a little bit more at, uh, in a future lesson, the difference between the entire bed and the head of the bed. But if the bed is the head of the bed is up and they want to lay down, you can lay them down as long as care plan doesn't indicate otherwise. We always go by that care plan, right? We can adjust the head of the bed for comfort if they request it. Good. So clean and safe. Comfort. We also want to make sure the patient is covered either with clothing or a sheet. But remember, they're feeling pretty vulnerable here. Those knobby knees are sticking out. They're in a hospital gown and not much more. So we have to make sure that they're covered either with a sheet or clothing. Good. That's a dignity issue. We're going to open that curtain and we're going to give them the call light. I like to give them instructions too. Here's your call light. Press the red button if you need me. Good. Everybody good with all that? Mm -hmm. All right. So all of those things have to be done. We don't care about the order. All of those things have to be done before you go clean your hands. And that has everything to do with the C that is not on this list. Cooties. Your patient has them, and you've touched them. So once you are done with your patient, once you have made sure they're clean and safe, covered, comfortable, and they have their call light, and you've opened that curtain, you need to get rid of all the cooties that you came in contact with. Now, once you've gone to the sink and you've washed your hands and removed all of those cooties, if you come back to this patient, you touch anything, you re cootied up. So what would you have to do? Wash them again. So you want to make sure you get absolutely everything done before you go wash those hands. Once you wash your hands, don't go back to the patient. Now, if we have to document, remember I said everybody gets a documentation skill for the test? Everybody gets one. If you have to document, you always document after you wash your hands because you don't want those cooties on that pin that's going to go in your pocket and home with you at the end of the day. So wash your hands and then document. But after you document, you have to wash again. So documentation skills require three hand washings, one at the beginning and two at the end. Good. So my closing is way longer, and it sounds something like this. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No? Okay, you're safe in the middle of the bed. Your environment is clean. Let me go ahead and straighten up that sheet just a little bit because it's driving me nuts. So we're going to straighten that sheet up. 
There we go. All right, your call light is right there beside you. I know these people can't see. Let me turn this real quick. There we go. All right, Ms. Jones, thank you very much. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No. Would you like a magazine? No. Okay, call lights right here. If you need anything at all, press that red button. I'll come help you. You're, the environment's clean. You're safe in the middle of the bed. I'm going to go ahead and open the curtain, wash my hands. If I need to document, I'll document now and wash them again. That is the closing. Longer. Way more words. This one takes a little more practice. The big thing to remember, the big takeaway on the closing is that the order doesn't matter until you get to hand washing. Once you get to hand washing, if you come back over here for any reason, you have to wash your hands again. Cooties. Got it? Questions? You want to use gloves? We're going to talk about gloves in detail on Wednesday, but the answer is not as much as you think. We'll talk about it on Wednesday. More importantly, I'm going to explain why. Right, the why is always important. The why is always important. All right, so any questions on all of that? When the closing, we wash our hands again twice. Do we have to go through the whole entire thing again? So we're going to talk about that on Wednesday, but the short answer is after the first skill, you're going to be told to simulate hand washing. Simulate means say. Okay. So your first skill, you're going to physically go to the sink, wash your hands during the opening, and they're going to grade it. The, at the end of your first skill, you're going to physically go to the sink, wash your hands, and they're going to grade it. After the first skill is over, leave that up for me, Caitlin. After the first skill is over, then they're going to tell you to simulate hand washing. But don't simulate until you're told to, because if you mess one of those up, they'll grade another one. So we don't simulate until we're told to. Remember, we always follow the nurse's instructions. They're nurses. We're going to follow their instructions. Okay? But we're going to simulate one. And that just cuts down on time. Simulate just means say, I would wash my hands now. All right, Debbie asks, in documenting, what if we don't remember the reading after washing our hands? Can we tell the evaluator our reading so they can save it for us? <laughs> uh, no, Debbie, unfortunately, that it doesn't work like that. There, you, for the test, you really shouldn't be talking to the evaluator much at all. We'll talk about that in a future lesson. It's not really about that. You want to try to remember it as best you can. Um, me, my own mind, visualization works, guys. Picture an index card. In your mind, in your mind, write the number on that index card. And then when you go to document, just recall that index card. The number will be there waiting for you. Visualization does work. It's crazy. When somebody told me that, I thought they were nuts. But it does work. It's weird. It puts it in short-term memory for you. Um, okay, one more thing. Bear with me, guys. I'm going to keep you probably two minutes late, okay? Just bear with me. One more thing. And that's indirect care. Um, there's a lesson on indirect care on page, oh, where is it? Page 28 and 29. I need you to read that for me because we're not going to have time to go over it in class. So I want you to read page 28 and 29 for me. Because I'm out of time. And I'm going to pass out the review sheet. At the end of every class, I give you guys. Oh, no, no, no. Let me put these. At the end of every class, I give you guys a review sheet that summarizes everything that we talked about. Um, There we go. That's indirect care. Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but you're going to read it on page 28 and 29. All right, and then let me get your review sheet. I'm going to pass this out. The answers are on the bottom. You're not going to turn this in. This is strictly for you to be able to um, 
basically remember everything that you learned in class today. You're also going to get some emails from us. Make sure you open the emails. How many of us are there? 14? So, I know, I, 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 trust me guys, when I say I'm talking for four hours straight, I mean I'm talking for four hours straight. I mean, I bring it right up to the time. And let me finish up while that's printing. Um, on Wednesday, you do not need to bring your blood pressure cups and stethoscopes. You do not need to bring the yellow book. You do need to bring the white book. Um, and then we'll be going over a lot of very important information on Wednesday. Today was important to get your books and to understand the care plan. Wednesday is important because it's infection control. And that's really where we have to start because it doesn't do us any good to learn how to do the skills if we're putting our patients in jeopardy while we're doing that. So infection control is probably the most important concept I've got to get across to you uh, moving forward. All right, please don't forget your homework. You're going to read chapter one in the yellow book. Take the test on page 181 in the white book and grade it. And um, you can, in lesson one of the online course is where we live stream. That's where this goes to. The replay will be up there. Um, you can also catch it on YouTube, on my Facebook page, on Instagram, we're everywhere. We live stream everywhere. Um, so you have access to all of this information if you want to go over it again. I'm very sorry that this was a little bit rushed today, that my technology did not cooperate. We're taking these home? Yep, the ID badges are yours. I've heard they get you discount at the movie theater. I don't know. Heard. Student rate. <laughs> I haven't tried, so I don't know. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, any questions? Moving forward, any questions? Is everybody happy with the class? Yes. Okay. Do you feel a little less anxious now yes. than you did when you first came in? First days, I can just feel <laughs> anxiety. All right. Um, anybody that uh, still has to make the other half a payment after class would be a good time to do that. I'll be at the um, at my computer. I can take that for you. Remember that this room only opens up about 10 minutes before class on Wednesday. And hopefully I'll be able to get all this technology sorted out today. Um, have a fantastic afternoon. Don't forget your homework, but have some fun too. Over here. Yeah, I'll be right there. I just want to get this. And stream.